was erected that, in essence, it would call for new hires to have Social Security. Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It's April 2nd, 2015. Would you please have the attendance? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Chiazzo? Here. Mrs. Ling? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Murray? Here. Ms. Hartle? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? No. Superintendent's report. Um, <clears throat> I direct your attention to this main DOE proficiency-based diploma extension visit. Um, it is, uh, the date of the visit was 2-25-2015. Um, I uh, received this as a cleaned up version of the report of the DOE team that came to visit. Uh, we requested, um, uh, the board requested, a, uh, an extension for the, the timeline on uh, proficiency-based diploma. That was granted, and as a condition of being granted, uh, there are periodic visits to see whether or not the district is uh, making progress. Um, I would just, um, I'm pleased to say that the report was very favorable, um, essentially, and you'll have a chance to read it, uh, the support, the, the uh, report supports our direction for these last 40 months and for the improvement plans uh, that will take us into the future. Uh, they endorse our thoughtful uh, systems thinking approach to um, what we call student-centered uh, learning. They call it proficiency-based and recognizes that we also have constraints. Um, one of those constraints is time in terms of professional learning. Another is uh, technology um, at our high school. And uh, they uh, wrapped up with no recommendations uh, that we change our approach or our trajectory uh, for the work that we have ongoing. So I wanted to share that with you uh, with that little summary as an introduction. And um, I believe that's all I really wanted to cover in my superintendent's report. Do you have a date that I projected that would be? Um, in terms of proficiency based? Yep. 2017? What, uh, 2017, the date for what we're projecting now that we would start proficiency based graduation? Okay. They're Thank current. you. What's, what's seventh grade? graders? Current seventh graders. Current seventh, okay. Okay. And the chair's report? Um, I really just only have one statement to make tonight, and that's just to uh, express appreciation to all the parents who, you know, have made their voices heard either through email or by coming to our meetings who attended the meeting a week ago to express their opinion about the calendar, and also to my fellow board members, because I know you've spent a lot of time online or in person with people uh, responding to, to various uh, questions around the calendars. So thank you for that. Good job. Okay. Committee reports. Mrs. Perry? Yes. The. Uh, Maine School Board's uh, Legislative Committee continues to meet via teleconferencing uh, weekly on Tuesdays. And I passed out, uh, cut off the press, that uh, bill that was put on the back burner and is being resurrected, it seems, that would, in, bottom line is, that what it would require is all new hires be part of Social Security and not main retirement system, which means that the town would then be required to pay uh, under Social Security, uh, a, well, I don't see the figure right, 3.36%, whereas under the retire, excuse me, 6.2%, where under the state retirement we pay 3.36 percent, 
which means, in essence, our contribution for retirement for our employees would about double. So uh, I say it's hot off the press. I got it a couple of hours before I came, and we will be watching that quite closely. Uh, as a member of the, the Board of Directors of Maine School Boards Association, I will be going out to SAD 6 with two of my colleagues on the 11th to help them with boardsmanship, and especially uh, they've asked how we all work together. And uh, as a board, each of our boards, and then as a board for Maine School, School Boards Associations. So. With regards to negotiations, uh, it appears as though we've finalized our contract with the, with the administrators group, and that is now in the editing stage. And uh, they have approved the concept. Hallelujah. And we are still in negotiations uh, with the cafeteria slash custodial group. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Lang. And the evaluation develop, development, we call EDT team, we met on March 26th, at 26th, and I wasn't be able to uh, attend. I know we it worked on the eye observation, continue, you know, learning it. Miss um, Zaidmo, um, do you mind uh, giving it a more? Uh, sure. Um, we, um, we think the state is going to uh, continue the pilot for all of next year, so um, we're hoping to get a direction on that. Um, we have developed a uh, document, a handbook, and user guide. There, most of it is done, except for the part from the state that has not been cleared up yet, and that is the measure of student growth. Um, so we're waiting to hear from the state. We have completed um, three trainings for all of our school leaders to participate in the eye observation, and um, it's called interrelated reliability um, in regards to protocol scoring and giving uh, people feedback. So we think we're in really good shape, uh, that team does, and we're hoping for the next part, which will be to roll out the uh, eye observation um, program to the teachers. Thank you. Okay, Ms. The Sebago Education Alliance <coughs> met uh, March 9th uh, out in Wyndham. And at that meeting, there was conversation about the alliances uh, moving forward now that the Alliance School will no longer be functioning. So um, there were, I believe, 29 students, 18 staff, and there were six with one-on-one. -on -one. And so um, each school district is now working on placements for those students. Um, Scarborough had three. One was transitioning out, so the other two are um, working with special services um, with Ms. Marchese up there. Um, also, um, there's still um, conversations about how program coordinations are still going to be continuing with the Spago Education Alliance. So just because there's no more Alliance school doesn't mean that we're not still working with the group of schools that we've been working with. So um, we are going to be working with curriculum pieces, potential of tech camp, and um, other services at <coughs> local sites. So um, the next meeting is April 13th, and I'll have another update uh, for that. Thank you. Ms. Murphy? So the policy committee has been meeting. Um, we regularly meet every other Wednesday. Um, in the last few weeks, we have actually bumped that up, and we met every week for the last several weeks. We've talked about the calendar um, a lot, and researching other districts' calendars, and figuring out if there's a compromise that can be made. Um, and we'll hear more about that, obviously. But we also spent a long time um, evaluating our policy about distribution of um, information that um, people might want to get in what would be usually in a Thursday or a Friday folder for the primary school kids. But we're trying to get away from paper, so we needed to reevaluate that policy because now it's not as labor intensive to get information out to parents because we're putting things on the website. There's actually a link on the website for um, community news. And it's not stuff that's necessarily endorsed by the school, but it has been approved by the superintendent or the designee to um, appear on that page. And it would be things like summer camps or lessons or um, outside sports groups like Little League or Scarborough Youth Lacrosse that are having their registration times. Information that is germane to parents of our students but are not 
school-sponsored events. Um, so we spent a long time um, discussing that policy, and there's also a portion that um, will be coming, I think, for our first meeting at our next business meeting that discusses distribution of materials at school-sponsored events by outside groups. So, um, you know, obviously no religious or political um, information, pamphleting or leafleting uh, would happen, or anything that's not directly related to the education of our students or would not pertain to students, would not be appropriate for kids. Um, and so that, that's a change, that's an addition to the policy, and that will come up for a first reading at the next business meeting. We'll have probably a whole bunch to review at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Shea? For communications, um, we meet directly after the policy meetings every other Wednesday. So our next meeting is next Wednesday, starting at 10, and then policy will be at 10. Communications will be right after at 11. We will be focusing, starting next week, we'll be focusing heavily on the budget, obviously, and trying to get as many questions answered that we hear from the public and getting correct information out there so you guys are armed with the correct information going forward. Uh, we will also post, you know, any information that we get that we don't put on the website, we'll put on Facebook. Make sure you're liking that page because that's the most up-to-date that we can push out to you quickly. And again, I think I say this every time, April 30th is the Community Dialogue. process uh, and we'll work with the town and board communication teams to ensure we get the message out early and often to provide folks with a, uh, enough lead time to plan on attending and start creating some questions. The combined board and council workshop was held last night to review the independent auditor's report for the school and the town. It's wonderful reading if you all decide. It's about four inches thick. Um, the good news um, which was all basically good news. There were no real negative reports. From the, t uh, the school department side, um, I'll just read you the comments from the auditor. Um, two best practices recommendations, which, were, which are considered very, very minor. They're just recommendations. They're not penalties or um, uh, discrepancies or anything like that. Um, cash receipts to the school nutrition program was noted, and student activity funds were noted in terms of uh, bank reconciliation evidence for review at the high school and Wentworth school, and cash receipts and dis disbursement approval at the Wentworth school. So very, very minor things. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good opportunity for the community to look at a third party auditor's approach to both the town and the school's budget to ensure that everything is transparent and everything is clear. So if you're really interested in real numbers, I suggest you go to the town website or the school board website and look at those audit reviews. That's something that's done independently by a third party. It doesn't come from either the town or the, or the school. Uh, first budget reading was also presented last night to the town council. Um, we um, looked at, um, obviously it was a first reading, um, the, the, we're, we're really experimenting, if you will, this year with a new process and uh, in terms of our joint finance committee meetings and trying to uh, collaboratively and collectively work together with the town to address budget concerns and questions up front and openly and honestly. So there's a new process for us this year. The council spoke very highly of it. Uh, I also will speak very highly of it. It's been very productive in terms of communication and in terms of taking away some of those um, misnomers that might be out in the public, certainly for the council. There's a lot of work left to do. Um, the process has resulted in some interesting situations in terms of first reading. There were some questions last night about the function of a first reading and the need for a first reading and how that works. Um, I, I, 
I'd just like to address the point that it's a process, and it's the first reading starts the process. It's a budget that we instruct the superintendent to put together a budget that he thinks is what is required to run the department. Um, he's not working in a vacuum. We are instructing him to do that. That's his job. That's our expectation. And that begins the discussion process. So the process is on track, as, as confusing as it may be. Um, it's working. It's working well. The communication between our two boards, our two governing bodies, is working well. There's more opportunities this year than ever for the public to have involvement. All the information's up on the websites, both websites. If you have questions, if information isn't there, email me, email the council, email any of your representatives, and we will get you the information if it's available. But you, you really have to try and respect the process as best we can at this point. Uh, finance met tonight. Uh, we discussed um, some very uh, positive things. Um, we are going to be removing styrofoam from the waste stream, and that sounds like a very minor thing, but it's taken us a long time to get to this point. So that was a direct response to a student uh, initiative that was presented to us about a year ago. So I'm hoping that uh, we certainly can recognize the Ecos Club for bringing that to our attention. And as hard as it's been with all the other distractions, we were able to pull something through and get a little bit of action on that. So that's very positive. Um, we also discussed the next, next steps for the budget process. And we have a new budget calendar that I believe you all have, all the board members have now, that was updated by Kate. If you don't have it, let me know. I can get it to you. Or uh, I'm sure it will be up. And here it comes as we speak. Uh, date, important dates. Uh, these are critical. Um, and I'll keep repeating these over and over, and they'll also be posted on the website. April, Thursday, April 9th, the school board leadership budget workshop is from 12 to 4.30 here in Chambers A. Um, that's not necessarily a public meeting in terms of being able to address, but it's an opportunity for the school board to work with the leadership council of the schools and ask questions about their budget and uh, work through that process. It's a very important part of our budget development process. Monday, April 13th, there is a finance committee meeting uh, from 12 to 1 in the superintendent's conference room. Um, that agenda is to be determined, but it's probably going to be preparation for the joint finance committee meeting. That is Tuesday, April 14th at 3.30 to 4 here in Chambers A. And then that same afternoon from 4 to 5, the school will be presenting its budget to the town council finance committee in the formal traditional way. As a department of the town, we have to introduce our budget to them and give them the opportunity to ask some questions along those lines. We also have uh, probably most, well, one of the things we have, we have a, a town finance review and final recommendation in Chambers A from 4 to 5 p.m. And that's, again, the town council finance committee's opportunity to um, review what we've given them and make recommendations, determine what the recommendations are going to be to the full town council. Then that evening, again, Wednesday, April 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. in the Winslow Homer Auditorium at Scarborough High School, we're going to have a budget forum. And that's everybody's opportunity to, to come, get some information from the town perspective, from the school perspective, and we'll all be available for questions. Um, I'm hoping the op-ed pieces that go out will be very clear in, in how we're hoping to manage that. We will have a moderator there. It won't be a, a, uh, a, an open discussion with a, an exchange. There'll be a mediator and a moderator there. We'll ask for questions ahead of time. Um, but certainly there'll be opportunities as well to ask questions there. So. Sorry for the long report, but as you all can imagine, it's a pretty busy time for us. Good. Thank you. Yes. Through you to, uh, to Kelly, uh, are you going to mention the backpack program? I can mention the backpack program. <laughs> Is that an official committee of mine now? I guess I can make it one. <laughs> um, so the Scarborough Schools Nutrition Department has a backpack program, and there are several students up to, I think they're now about 100 kids that receive supplemental food on long weekends and during vacations. And they otherwise rely on the school provided breakfast and lunch. So this backpack program is run entirely with volunteer hours and with uh, contributions from the community, either in cash or in food. And the backpacks will be packed again. I think actually it's still called the backpack program, but now I believe they use banana boxes. In all honesty, it's not backpacks anymore. 
But so it's non-perishable food. They are particularly looking for a pasta sauce, um, canned fruits and veggies, um, pasta, tuna, and hamburger helper. Um, and cereal. Cereal. And some, um, before some vacations, they have been able to, um, but from having gifts of cash given to them, able to go and shop and get some fresh food to add to the boxes. But primarily, um, it's non-perishable so that if, you know, there's a whole bunch that comes in before April, they can save some and then use it for Memorial Day weekend. But right now the shelves are pretty empty um, and they will be packing the backpacks or the boxes, I believe the Tuesday before vacation. So all this week and next, they are um, hoping for some donations and I will happily come and pick it up from anyone who has a box or a bag at their house or if you reach out to your neighbors and you get a whole bunch and get it at one neighbor's house, I'll come pick that up. Um, happy to do it and um, they recognize my car when I pull up so they open the door right up which is awesome so um, I can um, I'll put more on the Facebook page about what items in particular they're, they're looking for but the shelves are pretty empty right now so anything would help thank you very good ladies do we have uh, any reports from the schools um, the third quarter will be ending tomorrow uh, around the district, so we are looking forward to a successful uh, end of the school year. At the middle school, uh, Susical the mus Musical will be premiering Saturday, April 11th at 2 p.m., Friday, April 10th at 6 p.m., and Sunday, April 12th at 2 p.m., and all are invited to go watch that. Um, spring sports started practicing on Monday despite all of the snow still on the turf um, and are looking forward to a successful season. Project Graduation had a very successful fundraiser on Sunday when Bob Marley came for a comedy show at the high school. I went, it was a lot of fun. He picked on me personally. Um, <laughs> all students at the high school are registering for classes next year and starting to get that process going. Uh, juniors are looking forward to the SATs on April 15th, um, <laughs> and <laughs> during that time period, uh, the seniors will be participating in a job shadow experience uh, with the uh, freshmen and sophomores looking into some college and career options as well. At the middle school, the Interact Club is going to do a book drive uh, where they will all be donated to a school in, in Nigeria. Uh, many students and teachers participated in the Mary's Walk 5K uh, as part of the Red Storm Strikes Out Cancer team and raised lots of money and awareness for all types of cancer. Uh, intramural Volleyball will be starting next month and the 8th grade tournament started this week. And in March there was the Readathon and the March Madness College and Career Readiness, which was fun, informational, and successful. Um, in Wentworth, uh, Wentworth had its incoming third grade parent information night on March 25th and is very well attended. Wentworth sent home report cards last Thursday, March 26th, and began parent-teacher conferences this Monday, and that will continue through tomorrow, the 3rd. <clears throat> the Wentworth PTA is sponsoring the first Wentworth STEAM Fair, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. And that will be on April 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. And it's free for the entire Wentworth community. Um, in the K through 2 schools, starting Monday, March 30th, the kindergarten registration began for incoming kindergartners and will continue through tomorrow. So tomorrow's the last day for that. Uh, the schools are sending home report, report cards tomorrow, Friday the 3rd, as it's the end of the third quarter. Eight Corners is having a competition among the grade levels to keep the students active. So whichever grade logs in the most minutes of physical activity, they will be rewarded with an extra recess. Uh, May 4th and the 5th will be Eight Corners concerts at 6 p.m. at Scarborough High School. Very good. Thank you. Do we have a recognition this evening? Uh, we do. Um, we do. Recognition is typically uh, uh, only... Uh, taking a sprinkling of all the good things that are happening out there in the district and uh, telling a little bit about them. Uh, tonight we have the principals across K-12 and I thought um, why should I do that when they're here? So um, I invited them to step up and, uh, and be recognized uh, in terms of um, what's happening in their school and just a, a, a brief little tidbit. 
if you would. Should we start with high school or should we start with K2? K2 looks pretty ready. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good evening. I'm going to um, continue what Emma reported on with kindergarten registration. It did complete today. Um, we are very excited to welcome members of the class of if I did the calculations correctly, 2028. Oh. I know. <laughs> we had about 140 appointments, and um, parents come through with their children for registration screening appointments. It was a, a huge endeavor from the wonderful office staff and, and faculty at, um, at Wentworth who greeted our new families warmly and, and openly and made them feel comfortable and welcome in the school district from the very first moment they walked into this, the building um, to the maintenance department which set up and cleaned up and moved hundreds of unicycles out of the fitness room for us the morning <laughs> we were starting um, to IT who brought over a special computer and printer for us to use so we could print out reports for parents to take home immediately instead of waiting for things to come in the mail to see there's children's screening scores. Every staff, uh, every K-2 school sent over uh, teachers, speech and language therapists, OTs, secretary and administration to help the process. So it was a lot of people working together to make the class of 2028 feel warm, welcome, safe, and included. So we were very excited to do that and very proud of the effort that it took. And we're also uh, excited because it was the first year we had online sign-ups. So that was a, a big step towards being less paper, more digital. And that was challenging for some, but it, I think it worked out well overall. So we'll continue that. And we learned a lot of lessons of what to do next time. But So it all starts at kindergarten. <laughs> it does. Thank you. Donna, sorry, quick, just a yeah. quick question. Yeah. Um, Jumpstart and kindergarten boot camp, did those, did that, those, invitations, if you will, go out for the Jumpstart, or will those come later on? Yes, this year we are able to offer programming to um, almost as many people as want to participate. Um, in the past, our Jumpstart program was 24 days long, 25 days long, depending on the summer, and many people couldn't con uh, commit to a full 25 days, so they were asking for shorter time periods. So this summer we're able to offer two different programs. One is the full 24-day Jumpstart program. The second one is um, Kindergarten Camp, which is what we've called it. And it's two um, three-week sessions that are going along at the same time as Kindergarten Jumpstart, but they'll be half the amount of time. And people were able to sign up for those right away and indicate their interest. And I think we'll be able to um, accommodate everybody who has an interest in doing it. So it's more an opportunity for exposure and experience, not so much need-based, although those that need it, we encourage to come. But it, it's going to be a great opportunity for kids to ride the bus, be with new adults, be with new peers, be on, in a big school, get a little sample of what kindergarten is going to be like, and get a little jump start into, into what it's like to be in big school. So thank you for asking me. Yeah. Thank you. So with about two-thirds of the year behind us now at Wentworth School, I want to take the opportunity to sort of reflect on how our beautiful, incredible state-of-the-art facility has really impacted not only health and morale and excitement, but also um, the teaching and learning and sense of community that takes place at Wentworth School every day. Um, I want to start by sharing a few examples of the opportunities that our third through fifth graders now have that they, prob that they didn't have in the past. Um, so technology is a really clear place to start that I am so proud of our teachers. They didn't just toe dip into the technology, they cannonballed in and they a walk down the hallway, you see kids on laptops, Eno boards, hover cams, they're on Google Classroom, we're using 3D printers. It's, it's really incredible. So that is certainly an opportunity that they didn't have before. We're now able to also have school-wide assemblies at our school, and um, we've taken full advantage of that from opening day to 
a Bikes for Books 30 Book Reading Challenge assembly. Our D.A.R.E. graduation for our fifth graders was at our school in the gym, and the parents could sit in chairs and see their kids, and it was a comfortable temperature. So that <laughs> is like a huge improvement over um, the facility we had before, and we most recently celebrated community with the Maine Marimba Ensemble in our gym, so that was really great. Um, our Wentworth School Community Garden is... Um, we have ample space and big plans for the garden, so that's really exciting. We're um, able to incorporate our very own live weather station with that work, and that's something that we didn't have before, and we'll be able to include more students and the community, so that's exciting. Um, our concerts and performances, now um, we're able to use our very own stage. And so, for example, that enabled our most recent music concert to use all the percussion and ORF instruments without having to transport them to the high school. So it was just um, incredible to see what the kids are working on all year long. There's really this renewed sense of collaboration because we have the space to do it in now. Um, for example, several of our third and fourth grade classrooms collaborated. They used the learning commons. They used the shared team gathering spaces. They used the laptops and technology to um, learn about and follow the Iditarod mushers. And then this all culminated just yesterday, actually, out on our very own play field with the Iditarod. And it was really <laughs> sweet. And they had sleds. And they were learning about all of this so it was it was just awesome and then um, finally for our third through fifth graders I really believe that our students sense of pride has motivated them to pay it forward so we're seeing this increased um, engaged citizenship even to the third fourth and fifth grade level um, we've done several student initiated projects you heard about the Beanie Baby Drive that was at Wentworth School um, the 30 Abe's Penny Drive, Heifer International, and some school-wide efforts to stuff the bus and um, coats for kids. So that's been really wonderful. But it's not just our phase level. There have been all of these cross-phase level opportunities at Wentworth, too. So um, kindergarten registration, like Ms. Lovejoy just mentioned, um, the K-2 staff all meet together at Wentworth School, so the three buildings have an ample space to come together. And um, the middle school, we love inviting them over because it's just a short walk. And so <laughs> they walk over and they can, we can house their entire sixth grade in our cafeteria before lunch. There's no impact on our instruction and schedule. Um, so it also adds value to our students' experience. So for example, the Scarborough Middle School theater team came over and did four lunchtime performances for our students and um, it was great so they had dinner and a show our kids were riveted and the um, middle school students had a chance to um, have an authentic audience so that was great and then finally and I'll wrap up I know you told me to be brief but there's a lot to be excited about at Wentworth um, it's become a hub, really, for the general community. So there is hustle bustle long after the school day ends at Wentworth School. So from our STEAM fair that Emma mentioned um, to community services being housed in our school for before and after care, we have more than 10 co-curricular opportunities. The Gym Dandies just did an incredible three community performances in our gym with uh, Mr. Cahill said he thought over 1,500 people over the three days attended our youth recreation programs adult programs and then importantly Dr. Entwistle um, Wentworth is excited to host the third community dialogue on April 30th so the excitement of learning is present everywhere and just want to take the opportunity to thank the community for um, providing us with that thank you mm -hmm. any questions Thank you. That uh, is quite something to follow, but I do want to. <laughs> I do want to echo something that uh, Mrs. Crosby said. We have so enjoyed um, being able to take our walk our students over to Wentworth at any time to have to use small uh, rooms, use their cafeteria. We have plans to use the gymnasium for a big activity in May. Sixth graders are going back over the end of April. Um, they're, they're doing an expedition on weather, so they have a speaker coming. It's so easy. It's just right next door. So it has been a wonderful opportunity for, uh, for our school, so thank you. Um, we just finished our first week of MEA online testing. Our eighth graders were the 
guinea pigs. They were fabulous. I do want to recognize Michelle Grant, the guidance counselor. She, I want to thank her for her leadership. She really organized, headed up this whole project. It was quite a project. We had IT involved, uh, Phil Kalick involved, Monique Culbertson helped us plan. It was a major undertaking and everybody did a wonderful job. I want to recognize the eighth grade teachers and students for their hard work and their flexibility. And we are going to really learn lessons from, um, from what they did with us this week with the testing as we begin testing our sixth graders next week. I checked with students um, every day after testing. I got um, interesting responses. They were, the first day, they, it, the first day was the um, computer adaptive ELA, English language arts test, and they, they thought that was, they liked that one. They also liked the math computer adapted. Um, they were not so sure that they liked the ELA performance task. It was very difficult. They had a classroom activity, and then they had to write for two hours. That a little report. It was quite extensive, quite rigorous. Some liked it, some found it difficult. Today, overwhelming enthusiasm about the math performance task. They loved it. It was a uh, real world. It was rigorous. Um, and they couldn't say enough about how positive they were about the test. So thank you to eighth graders. Thank you to the teachers, uh, Michelle Grant and her team for organizing it. And um, we'll start with sixth graders on Monday. Thank you. Question? Yes. How many hours did all of this take out of the children's education this week? Seven and a half. The test is an educational it, The test was actually an education. Um, seven and a half hours. Oof. So we did a little bit every day. Uh, now that the testing is computerized, when do you expect to see the results and how quickly will those translate back into classroom? Mrs. Experience? Culbertson? That's what I thought. Did yeah. you hear that? Towards yes, the end of June. Yeah, thank you. Now, will, is that going to be a test in the fall and then in the spring again? Mm -hmm. No, it's always only in the spring. Spring. Okay. okay. Thank you. All set. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hey. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about some of the things that Chris and Ari did a wonderful job explaining to you, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, April 15th. And before I talk about it, I do want to also mention that we just finished two weeks of testing with the MEAs, and we lost eight and a half hours. But um, Ryan Susie and Monique Culbertson did a wonderful job of leading us through that process. And I think uh, even though it was difficult at times, I think our teachers also did a wonderful job of making accommodations in the classroom. And I know some parents were worried about the time away from class, but I think we made great adjustments. Um, as Kristen had mentioned, we have a special educational uh, day prepared for all of our students at the high school on April 15th. So members of our school leadership team and local community leaders, and Mr. Chiazzo is one of the representatives, have created uh, a unique educational experience for each grade level. So. For our grade 9 and 10 students, they'll come to school on the 15th at the normal time. Uh, they'll start the day with two vocational presentations, one from the West Westbrook Regional Vocational Center and one from PATHS. Uh, each group will get a chance, 9th and 10th graders, to view that presentation and then switch. At around 9.30 or quarter of 10, we're then going to transport all of our 9th graders to SMCC. And SMCC has an extensive program in place for them to rotate basically through all the disciplines they have throughout the course of the day, get a chance to see the facility and eat lunch there. Uh, about 1.30, they're going to leave SMCC and come back to the high school. And we'll have staff that are going to be with them. Um, our juniors uh, don't have the most exciting piece of that day, but our juniors are doing the SAT or AccuPlacer. And so that piece will take a majority of the day, but when they finish at around 12.30 or 1, we have a barbecue planned for them because they've had a full day of testing, and then they'll be finished for the day. Um, our seniors 
have a really unique experience, and I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be something that uh, they're going to be really pleased to do. We're going to start our day with having 20 or 25 business leaders meet with our seniors and have breakfast from about 7.30 to 8. And then from 8 to 10 o'clock, we're going to have a workshop. And the local uh, business leaders and staff created a concept about basically those skills that are necessary for our students to be successful when they graduate, which is soon, whether it's career or college. And so our theme is going to be based on three principles, three concepts, uh, with three 30-minute workshops being held. One is on communication skills. The other one is on emotional intelligence or situational awareness. And the third is on teamwork. So rather than have the same teachers or principals or assistant principals doing this, local business leaders and community leaders are going to lead these sessions. And so after the workshop is completed, the, the, each of our seniors is then going to have an opportunity to leave at around 10 o'clock and go job shadow for uh, a career of their choice uh, over the course of the next three hours. So from 10.30 to 1.30, they'll have an opportunity to be in our community or at a neighboring community and uh, have an opportunity to experience right on that work site with those professionals what that job is really like. And then uh, that would be the end of their particular day. So. Uh, we are really pleased to be partnering up with the local community. Uh, the business leaders have been wonderful. They're a, an integral part of this process. Um, in education, we always talk about can we do something a little different and get outside of you know, the normal walls of the school and, and provide something for our students. And we never really seem to have an opportunity or the resources to do that. And we finally have a chance in this uh, situation, and it's primarily because of the support from Dr. Entwistle and also from the local businesses and community leaders. So um, that, in a nutshell, is our April 15th. Um, we think it's going to be a springboard event for things we can do in the future. Wow, oh, any questions? I just missed, what were the 10th graders doing? I'm sorry, 9th and 10th graders are doing the vocational in the morning? Yep. Oh, you're right. I did leave out the 10th uh, graders. 9th graders are going to SMCC. 10th right. graders are going to be going to either UNE or USM. Okay. And all three colleges have uh, programs that they're going to, the students are going to rotate through. And they get to eat lunch with the college kids there. They're going to get a chance to explore the campus and get a real good feel for the college atmosphere. Uh, no question. I just wanted to reiterate uh, Mr. Creech's comment to the business leaders of the community. Uh, they've been absolutely phenomenal. This is very much a collaborative effort. Um, uh, the, everybody we've worked with has been very open, and uh, the, the response of resources, both time and materials, have, has been just absolutely immense, and I'm hoping we can use this as a foundation for pretty much every year. Uh, if we can keep this working together, I think the, the kids are in store for a really, really, really great opportunity, and so is the community, for that matter. It gives the community leaders an opportunity to, to see what's going on in our schools and see what great product it is we're putting out at the high school. So. Thank you, Mr. Creech. I think this is going to be great. I shared with Dr. Wentwistle also that USM has, word has gotten out with other high schools what we're doing for a model, and, mm -hmm. and it's become um, such a popular thing that USM is actually going to use a day next year where they don't have their representatives go out and doing tours. They're going to designate it specifically just for high schools to come and do what we're going to do. Mm. So hopefully this is the beginning of some uh, valuable experiences for local area high schools. I said just as soon as, just as long as we get our special treatment that we want. <laughs> I, I put That's that great. plug in after you told me that. I, I, I. Um, data, uh, David, I was just wondering, have you exhausted all your need now? You filled all your need for your business people, or is there still a need out there for additional You know, it's almost like forward? we planned this. That was, that's a great segue. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out how I could get that in, so thank you. Um, you know, we have over 200 seniors, and we've had a wealth of uh, local business and community leaders who have opened up for the job shadowing piece, but we still have room for more. Mm. So one of the things we've also done is a handful of seniors uh, approached us and indicated that they wanted to go and job shadow with their parents because that was a career they're interested in. So we've now opened it up to the parents of the seniors if they want to do that as well. But we, are, um, we absolutely can take on other uh, business leaders or community members who would like to job shadow one, two, or three students at their workplace. And if that's the case, you can, uh, those community leaders can contact me at the high school. They can email me. Okay. Thank you. Or, or on the board. The or, or me through the board email. That's fine, too. Whatever works. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, thank you to all of our principals for, you know, kind of catching us up. It's really great to, to hear the kind of work you're doing right on the, you know, on the front lines. We're here making the policies and trying to solve problems, and um, it, it's terrific to hear what's actually happening in all of your schools. So, thank you. Okay. So, on to 10.0, new business, 10.1. The meeting minutes of February 26, 2015. Do we have approval a motion? Approval is printed. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Seven. Ten point two. The meeting minutes of March 5th, from which I will abstain since I was not here. Move approval is printed. Second. Discussion? Any corrections? Nothing? Very good. All in favor? Oops. <laughs> Six. Very good. Thank you. 10.3. An update on the 2016 France trip. And do we have, yes, Hel is it Helen? Good evening. Thank you. Helene. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm a little puzzled why it says an update. It's actually I'm here to ask, uh, to present the proposal and ask for permission to actually open the trip for 2016 for a spring break, just like the trip of this year. Uh, the trip's going to be in France again. Uh, we're going to start in Paris this time, as this year we start in the south and we go up all the way to Paris this time. And uh, next year we're starting in Paris, going through Biarritz, through Provence, and ending on uh, Côte d'Azur. Um, Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast. No. <laughs> French Blue. Riviera. Yeah, the French Riviera, that's right. The Blue Coast, that's right. We're going to end on the French Riviera this year, so we'll do it a little bit backwards. Uh, the cost is uh, $3,310 for students. It has gone up by $200, if I remember right, of the price of this year. Uh, the dates are spring break. There's no school days being missed, hopefully. They are, uh, and that has happened this year. We were supposed to leave on the Friday and come back on the Sunday, and unfortunately they were not able to book our flight that way. We were one day off. So they are going to be missing the Monday coming back. Uh, we're missing one day this year. Uh, I asked to please try to book us earlier next year. Um, but they were informing me that, yes, again, there might be a risk of a day in or out of our dates. But the, the, the brunt of the trip is during, I'm talking about one day on or off. Any questions? I, I don't want to speak for the superintendent by any stretch of the imagination, but I think I, I would be, <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd be willing to, uh, as a board member from a policy, say, okay, if you miss a day, as long as we get feedback from them, I'd like to maybe have a couple of them come in and talk to us about their experience and let us Actually, know I how. I plan to do that with the kids I'm taking. Uh, we're leaving in two weeks on the 18th. So that, that would be great to have them come back and give us some feedback and, and see the results of that trip. So I, again, I didn't want to authorize that, of course, Dr. Andrews, so that's your department, but I, and I don't want to speak to- have one right there, actually. <laughs> Emma's I don't want to speak from Mr. Oh, Chiazzo, no. but we've, we've already made They're that going. arrangement. Yeah. Um, oh, that's and, great. So the students are expected to come, right? Okay. Very good. Very good, thank you. I, do we, we need a motion? Uh, do we, do we need a uh, No, we don't it's need a just motion. an, yeah. an advice, yeah. just uh, yeah. notifying you. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank good. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sounds like a wonderful trip. Enjoy yourself this spring, too. And 10.4, uh, facility waiver request. Do we have someone here from the Mix and Mingle Square Dances? Yes, we do. Yes, would you like to come to podium? <laughs> I'm Mike Grimmett, and I'm with Mix and Mingle, and we do ask every year for a waiver to uh, use Wentworth and Eight Corner School for our square dancing. And at the end of the year, if we have any money left over from paying our callers and our cures, we donate whatever we can to the school department. 
and we this year we've thoroughly enjoyed Wentworth School. It has been <laughs> wonderful, oh, and we good. thank you very kindly. It would be my recommendation that the board approve this request. Mm -hmm. So move. Do I have a second? Second. Yep. Any discussion? Very good. All in favor? Seven. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Have a good time. <laughs> Have a good time. Yeah. Ten point five is the first reading of the Leadership Council FY sixteen budget. And so uh, Dr. Entwistle, would you sure. lead us through? Uh, I provided an introduction and rollout um, as a first reading last evening um, in a uh, combo meeting with um, the, uh, the town manager and myself um, presenting the school and, and the municipal budget. Um, basically an overview, it is a rollout and it, the purpose is for a first reading. Um, the first reading is uh, sort of the, the, the starting point uh, for processing and more discussion. Uh, the vote on the school budget um, doesn't happen for uh, another couple of months. Uh, I did prepare um, for uh, board members uh, the narrative uh, that I presented along with the slides. For those who were there last night, the slides were a little shaky. They were in and out. Um, I think by the time uh, I get to my second or third slide, uh, the system had, had stabilized, and so you got to uh, actually see them. Um, I have a draft on this because um, I haven't had a chance to really um, thoroughly uh, review it, uh, but it will be up on, when it, after I do look at it, make sure uh, it doesn't require any revisions, um, it will be posted um, on the website. Um, so rather than present that uh, presentation to you again, which um, I know you'd probably enjoy, but um, we'll, uh, I, I thought I could expedite it by giving you uh, the handout. It's exactly what you saw last night. Kate, did you want to say anything? Say a word or two. Now that it's budget season, I can't get away without going to board meetings now that it's budget season. Um, I just wanted to mention really quickly the next steps. Um, Chris has already covered this in his committee report, but um, I did give uh, little binders to each of the board members. If you don't have one or if you uh, need one, let me know. Um, but really what we're aiming to do next is to delve into the details of the budget. Um, we'll, we're looking forward to our workshop meeting, which is coming up next Thursday. April 9th in the afternoon. That is a public meeting. It's held here in chambers. And um, our goal will be to start digging in and finding out what's in the school budget. Um, and, you know, this is something that the school uh, leaders have crafted, and we've spent a lot of time on it, but it's not something that the board has spent a lot of time with yet. Although there probably aren't a whole lot of surprises in it because it's pretty much the status quo. Um, there will be a lot of things to discuss, and there will be a lot of things to share with the public as well. So uh, my hope is for uh, an opportunity to fill those binders for you uh, with all kinds of useful data sheets and also to be able to answer questions as they arise. And, you know, we've talked a lot in Finance Committee about making sure that if we have a question, chances are that somebody in the community has that same question and we'd love to be able to answer it and make sure that things get posted on the website, uh, make sure that things get addressed in public meetings, and uh, just try and, and keep up with all of the masses of little questions and data and pieces of information that might be helpful to people as they form their opinions about this budget. Um, so I, I don't have any really detailed presentation tonight. I'm just sort of doing this little kickoff thing. And But if you do have any questions right now that you'd like us to plan for, um, you can speak to me now or you can also communicate with me be, via email or uh, Chris is standing by to take notes on the types of things that you'd like to hear about as we go forward. I do just have one clarifying question because I was unclear last night. Um, the number that's being carried right now for health insurance potential increases, is that 5 or 8% that's 
It's currently 5%. Okay. Um, I, I think that the confusion might arise because when we started the budget projection, we had 8% in there. That was sort of an average of what people in the surrounding areas who have the same insurance were, were budgeting. Okay. All the business managers get online and talk to each other this time of year. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, so we had come up with an 8% as a guess. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was information released to us by Anthem that said, the maximum amount that they're going to charge, the highest premium, will be a 5% increase. Okay. But their system is to have bands of premiums, and what we're hoping for is to be somewhat lower than 5%. Mm -hmm. But the current number is at 5%. Okay. And um, I, I believe somewhere in the budget documentation we've got an, a note that says that a percentage point for our Anthem coverage is about $50,000. Right. So those those percentage points make a difference, and, and we're looking forward to being able to reduce that. Um, Anthem is supposed to come out with their uh, premiums this week. This week is fading fast, so uh, we'll hope to have something a little more solid in hand when we come together on April 9th. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I just a question. Um, has the finance committee worked through this budget, or is it just to um, have you guys the look through in details? Nine, no. Nine, no. Okay. Thank you. No. This is this is really the the very beginning of that process. So uh, we haven't done any line item reviews. Um, I'm I would imagine that the April 9th will be a little bit more of a chunking of the material, and then the finance committee can dig into the line items as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, not a question. I just wanted to reiterate a couple things. Um, first of all, it is, as Kate mentioned, and it was mentioned yesterday at the council meeting, this is really a works in progress. We're not going to have, we're going to have key components of this budget even after it goes to vote, just simply because of the nature of the way the process is working and the reliance on Augusta for information. So, so I, I, it's, I, I I really want to caution people about the initial reaction that we get every time the, uh, we, we put the first reading budget out there. It, there's a lot of, um, you know, it's, it's, a good, it's a good guess, but it is just that. It's a guess at this point until we get more firm and more hard data in. So um, there seemed to be a little bit of concern last night that the number that was going to be put up there was the number we were running with, and that's it, and we're done. And they were approving that as the budget. That's not the case in any stretch of the imagination. So it is a fluid process. All of the documentation as we get, you will get. It'll be posted. Uh, it, it'll be available either through um, the Finance Committee web, uh, uh, web page or the Budget web page. We're going to try and put links together to it. But the first reading was just that. It was a first reading for everybody. So we haven't had the opportunity to get into the nuts and bolts of it yet. We have time in the, uh, uh, the calendar to do that, and we certainly will do that. But there are going to be components to this that aren't going to be readily available. So please be patient with us. Please understand that you've got all the information we've got. Um, none of these decisions are being made in a vacuum, and they're all being out there and, and transparent. I, I would just second what Chris says about the website. I mean, we really are trying to use that as a tool, and um, the town webmaster has done an amazing job setting things up so that there's a lot more um, capacity there and um, it's a little easier to navigate but we do have two web pages uh, on the Scarborough Schools website one says budget and there's a little um, what do you call that on the sidebar there there's there's links on the sidebar that you see I'm terribly savvy about this I was just bragging earlier that I now have the and access to edit on there, so I'm really dangerous. Um, but there's a link that says budget, and then there's a link that says standing committees. And if you go to either one of those, we hope that you'll have the information under finance or you'll have it under budget, and hopefully both places. Want to make it simple for people and, and make sure that as we ask questions and get them answered, that we're also putting them out there for other folks who may have those same questions. Yes. I just wanted to also um, encourage people to continue to be involved. It's fantastic to see some faces out here in our meetings. Usually we sit here all alone, so it's nice to see some parents here. But it's important to stay involved in it. It be can become very overwhelming. And I encourage you to ask questions if you see something that doesn't make sense or you don't understand. 
you're probably not alone in not understanding that, and it's, it's helpful to us to know, okay, this isn't clear to the general public. We need to figure out how to get that information out there clearer, and, you know, it's, it's good for us to get those questions so then we have an idea of what's not getting through. Right, and we keep saying that if one person has a question, chances are 20 people have the same one, but they haven't thought or about asking Or we've already had it, it and <laughs> have asked it. And right, and, and so we're, we're working on some ideas about things like FAQs and, you know, things that are common questions that keep arising so that we're not answering one individual and then another and then another. So trying to be a little bit more um, proactive with some of these things. I, I would also like to request a, uh, some some patience with us as well. So if you ask us or email us a question and we don't get back to you within, a, you know, um, a, d a day, certainly if it goes more than two days, fire it off again. But, you know, please be patient with us. We do have a lot of things on our plate. And, you know, the questions are important. They are. But oftentimes the question requires tasking Kate or somebody else to, to dig in deep if we don't have the answer readily available. So that does take time. To, to to shift resources, so so please be patient and and uh, um, consider it when your when your questions come in. Very good, thank you, Kate. And before you take off, uh, since this did go uh, last night and this evening, um, just just an overview. Uh, you, there's people here who may wish to have a question or come up to the podium on this topic. On this topic, if you would like to do so, please come up right now, and we will listen to you. State your name and your address. Three minutes. Uh, my name is Betsy Glycine. I'm from 14 Longmeadow Road, and um, I had a question about the capital budget, the laptop proposals. Um, how will that be voted on? That that's voted on by the town council. Is it a charter issue? Um, but by vote to the voters. So, can you explain that process? And um, part two of that question, so I don't have to get back up here, is um, okay. What um, what additional input um, from the public are you going to get on this laptop proposal? Is there plans for public hearings specifically about the one-to-one -one laptop proposals? So that's my question, then I can just sit down. Thanks. Um, well, I can speak to the financing piece. Um, the laptop proposal is a piece of our capital budget. Um, it's not considered a, a referendum eligible piece because although the charter says that expenditures over $400,000 are brought to referendum in the town, it doesn't include uh, purchases that are not one big thing. And I'm not really sure that's a, an accounting term. But if you buy a fire truck that costs $400,000, that's a fire truck. If you have individual components that make up an expenditure, generally with technology, we don't do a referendum vote. Um, but it will be voted on by the town council as part of our capital budget. And of course by the board. So the piece about public input, uh, I don't really have an, yeah, an answer. I, I, can, I can field that one. Um, you're certainly welcome to, to email uh, me directly, or if any questions you have uh, or concerns you have, I'd, I'd certainly be willing to, to, to listen and take those under advisement. Um, typically, we don't open up individual line items or individual issues to, to public discussion specifically. Um, we're going to be discussing, as part of the budget, where we're going to allocate the funds from, whether it's portions from CIP, from the operating budget. Um, it'll be uh, addressed along those lines, but typically we don't address individual line by lines in a, in a public kind of form. But certainly if you have questions, um, we can walk you through the proposal that's been presented, um, all the data that we have, you have, um, and, and basically it's, it gets rolled into the, to the general budget discussions. So I guess I just a single vote so in other words can I support the school budget and not support the laptops no so you're it, saying it, it's all or nothing um, it, you don't actually vote on the CIP right. budget right you only vote on the school operating budget as a right. citizen okay so the one we're voting on is the operating and that will not include the laptops That's correct. so we would need to talk to our counselors about their vote they can vote that one item up or down 
No, you said the, that. I believe the CIP budget is taken as a whole, if I understand properly. So there's not, right. there, we don't do line item vetoes or line item. Uh, You're saying uh, whole CIP. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So the so CIP budget. In it. Yeah. Yes. Whatever I got else it. is yeah. in it. All right. I so got I think, it. Does that make I think sense? your best bet would probably be to try and give as much feedback as you can to the school board as okay. they're going through their process because they're ultimately going to have a second reading on CIP okay. and say this is what stays in, this is what goes. Okay. And then the council has to approve that. So, so there's two levels. It was hard to see the presentation last night, but your overall CIP budget is like 1.4 million. 1.5. Right? It's but okay. again, I, I really want to reiterate that's a first reading. We Right. We haven't gone through process, right? Okay. It, it's going to go through the same process that the operation budget goes through, and the same uh, uh, scrutinization and the same development process. So, that okay. that's where we started off with. Yes, yeah. So, is it a possibility that you would change the the plan, like, so, or or would you because the plan is for thirteen hundred and fifty certain types of laptops, or would somebody say, hey, why don't we do $300 Chromebooks? Is that something that's still on the table? Well, if I could just yeah, jump in here. Um, so I think it was back in February, we had a lengthy presentation done by our tech specialist in the town. And if you go on the website, on the school's website, you'll be able to see that whole presentation. And that will kind of give you all the information I think you're going to need about how it was arrived at, what type of computers. And it, it, it was, gosh, I don't know, she spent a good hour with us just hour. going over everything that she I had can, done all year. Yeah. And that was the second. Be rigidity, you know, that, we, that we be careful that we don't get in a position where I just have to vote up or down, even though I want to vote, I want to vote for something. You know, and I want to now I'm gonna have to ask my counselor, just vote it, just get rid of it because it's you know, it's too much. You know, so I, I would just caution against rigidity on it, you know, to say, Okay, we we we've already decided exactly what it is and this is how we're gonna deal with it. That would just be my suggestion. I understand you spent time on it in February, I understand your technical person did. I'm not questioning yeah. any of that. I'm just saying I hope we don't end up in a position where we don't feel comfortable support, supporting the whole thing, but we wanna support something. Yeah. If I can, again, and I know, I know this isn't the right, it's not a debate option at this point, but I, I do want to reiterate the fact that the part of the scrutinization process is we will sit down with the superintendent of the finance committee, go through that proposal, discuss how it's going to be defund, funded. We have, we often ask the question of, you know, are there other alternatives, less costly alternatives that still meet the needs? So that's part of our internal evaluation process, but that's not necessarily something that we open up to public input. I'll get the input if you want to send an email, and I'll under, I, I, I can be aware of your concerns and okay. either address those through the proposal process or bring those up for further clarification if, if they don't make sense to us. But at the end of the day, we still uh, it, our our prerogative has to be to make a decision to move the process forward and and provide the resources that we need. So so your input is very welcome and very much considered. But it's not a direct input. We won't have an open forum to say, okay, who in the public wants to speak for this or against this. Does, okay. that, does that make sense? I totally agree with it. I think that's okay. probably not the best plan for trying to get something through. That's just my personal opinion, but I, I understand mm -hmm. it. I appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, and it has been a two-year process, too. It, it wasn't just this year. We've been looking at this for two years. And Dr. Antusel, do you there, want to add? There are two, um, two great resources on the Scarborough website. Um, a technology investment proposal for Scarborough High School. It's dated March 19th. There's both a PowerPoint presentation and the full proposal document is there where all of the analysis has been done for um, each of the um, uh, each of the units that met the functional requirements. It talks about the process that has been used. Um, so I, I think that that would be very helpful as well. Um, one other, there was also another meeting in January where we spent a good amount of time um, talking about each of the different um, possibilities, device. which which device it would be. So that's another meeting you might want to look up. It was um, the meeting that was held in the public library conference room. So watch that one and watch the one that was just a few weeks ago, I think late February, and it will give you the full background. But again, we have, we spent a long time on it last year, and it ultimately didn't make the cut for the budget last year. So we've been in this for a couple of years, and those are the two most recent resources for you, though. Thank you, Kate. Anyone else from the public wish to speak on this topic? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll close the public comments. Um, so this was our first reading for the Leadership Council's 
FY16 budget. Do we have a motion to accept that? Move approval for the first reading of the budget. Second. Any other further discussion? Seeing Let none. The games begin. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say tag your it. <laughs> oh, all in favor? Seven. Thank you. 10.6, the second reading for the 1516 school calendar. If there's anyone from the public who wishes to speak on this item, uh, please come up to the podium, state your name, where you live, and if you can keep your comments to about three minutes. Thank you. My name is Michelle Markham. I live at 12 Laurel Ridge Road. I appreciate the special meeting that you had last week to allow for the public comments and the latest revision to the school calendar, but I do not think it is sufficiently addresses the concerns of the parents that was overwhelmingly voiced last week against having late starts. I now understand that for the 2015-16 school year, you are bound to the Wednesdays as the day for professional development, but you are not obligated to late starts. The increase in late starts for high school students is not in the best interest of the students. Although you say the school will be open early for the high school students for nine late starts, since they will be bussed in early at their regular start time, there are very limited options for them to utilize their time, which is very valuable to students. Scarborough has many students who work exceptionally hard and balance homework, sports, extracurricular activities, jobs, and their time would be best utilized with an early release. If you have resources available to supervise high school students for late starts, then I would recommend you utilize those resources as an option to supervise the high school students for an early release. Since last week you mentioned that some students need supervision, although I strongly doubt this is the majority of the students. Although I am strongly against late starts in future years, I would recommend if the Scarborough School Administration is adamant about having late starts, then work with the other schools that we need to have coordinating schedules and calendars with and change the day to Mondays. This will be less disruptive to the students' schedules. And you can go to early release, and if you decide to go to early release, um, I recommend you go back to Fridays again, as again, that would be the least disruptive option to students who should be our first priority. School board, I ask that you think of the best option for the majority of the Scarborough students and vote down the calendar that is proposed and, if necessary, revert to the current year calendar until an appropriate calendar can be presented that satisfies the majority of the stakeholders. I'd like to thank you again for all of your hard work and your dedication. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Andrew Cowan, uh, 3 Silverwork Circle. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote to every board member in my strong opposition to the late start dates. I'm also strongly opposed to early release dates. I won't go over uh, what I wrote to everybody. I have something else to address um, with you. And it's more of a comment slash question. I read through the uh, contract with the teachers. And in Article 3, Paragraph E1, it says that it is agreed that each phase of the instruction day shall be six hours and 25 minutes. How does starting late once a week I guess I see a conflict between what's in the contract and the proposal to start late every Wednesday. It, that's simply my question slash comment. So what specifically is your question? If the if you guys vote to accept early um, late start dates or early release dates, I feel that it's in conflict with the contract that you've signed with the teachers. Because because the teachers will not be providing six, point, six hours and 25 minutes of instructional time. Right. For each, each instructional day, that's their requirement. Uh, but they would, this is carving out paid time for teachers to get the, um, the, the teacher learning time that they need. So it's specifically addressing the length of an instructional day. Okay. So the length of an instructional day each week will be reduced. 
So will the, there be the length additional of, additional days put on the calendar? No. No. Okay. So it's, I kind of it is carving it is carving in to instructional time in, that the teacher is not providing instruction but is instead learning. Okay. Yeah. And so there's no issue with any conflict with the contract. No. Okay. There, there have been late starts and well. Uh, late starts is more recent. Uh, there have been uh, early releases for a very long period of time, which, which also cut short teachers. In fact, it cuts teachers' instructional time short more than the late starts do. Okay. And that has been happening in this district way before I arrived here. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, anyone else? So this is basically for comment time. two different handouts. Um, so hopefully there's one for a person or you can just share a little bit. And um, I'm going to do the best I can to read my comments. It's not very personal, but it keeps you have me to from pull that microphone my, down. Okay. Yep. And again, my name is Betsy Glycine. I'm from Long Meadow Road. Um, I want to say again how difficult it is to get up here. It is not an easy thing to um, speak about this issue or even to ask questions often. Um, but when it comes to this calendar issue, um, I've spent a lot of time reviewing the five options on the table. And um, what I've presented tonight is um, the amount of instructional time, uh, the amount of um, professional development time that's been requested for each one of the five options. And on the second page, I'm um, presenting the amount of uh, the amount of instructional decrease for the high school that has been asked asked for on this particular page. Um, and um, I'll address that in just a minute. Um, so it took me over 90 minutes to collate this information, probably even longer, and I believe that speaks to the complexity of the major changes that, that are being proposed. Unfortunately, none of the current options are acceptable in my opinion. Last week you told us the state requirement to submit the calendar has been met. So I urge you to table this vote tonight so other options can be brought forward besides the five that have been uh, posted to the website. If you feel this is absolutely not an option, I urge, you to, I urge you to vote no on all of these options and keep the current school calendar and the current amount of professional development. <clears throat> Last week it might have been helpful if we had started our discussion at the public hearing with a few parameters. Wednesdays for PD time are non-negotiable due to reasons beyond our control this year. There's also no line items in the budget to add instructional days. And as Dr. Entwistle just um, explained, it is increased PD is at the expense of instructional time. I can tell you from personal experience, several people I talked to about this absolutely did not understand that from last week's meeting. And I can tell you that a fair number of people felt it was a bit of a bait and switch because they felt they were advocating for this to be in the budget if you needed extra PD time. And what I explained is I don't think it was. Now tonight, Chris, you said that we're early in the budget process, so perhaps that's a consideration at that time. So you heard that we support PD. You even heard from a, um, a teacher who uh, said she gets PD time, but urged you to not reduce instructional time. Um, in an ideal world, PD would not impact instructional time at all. As a matter of fact, you told us that's what you would do if you had the budget. It wouldn't impact, but it's not realistic from a budget pers perspective. Um, so we are looking for compromises. Um, you heard that for us, the second, a full day is a great option for parents. Um, and you told us that's not as productive for staff. And so we said that's that's understandable. Um, you heard from us the third best option is early release. Um, and lastly, you heard from us that the late starts are the worst possible way to provide professional development. Um, and when it comes to finding compromises for families, students, teachers, and administrators. Um, the issue is more than just convenience. I heard that time and time again. Well, it's inconvenient for all of us. Late starts are disruptive to families, and it's disruptive especially to student routine, and the time is not productive for our students. With early release, the possibilities of productive time are almost endless. I included some of them on my handout. Students can take classes, music, art, cooking, sports clinics, robotics, many others. They can prep for college exams. They can volunteer. They can do homework. They can do group projects 
internships. They can earn money at a job. They can visit a museum. They can visit a business for a half-day internship. They can do chores. Okay, not my kids, but other kids can do chores, possibly. Go to the library. Go shopping. Meet with friends. I'm sorry, the list is endless. But with late start, the options are very few. Sleep in. Do some homework, maybe, if you think you can get it done in that amount of time. Maybe do some chores. Again, not my kids, but maybe somebody else's kid. So it is really beyond my comprehension why this doesn't matter. I didn't feel last week like it mattered how well that time could be used productively, that we know our teachers need that PD time, but our students need time that is also productive. And that, to me, is where the compromise is, is coming. Um, more than anything, I think you heard that we greatly value instructional, instructional time with our wonderful teachers. Um, we, don't, we, we don't want just early release days thrown in because we like them. You know, the best option would be to, have to, to be able to hide these. Um, but if we can't do that, then we're asking for early release. At least a large majority of us are, and no one spoke for late start, although I'm sure there are some people out there who have they should get up here because it's not fun. Um, so I look at all five options. I have to say I'm disappointed. All five cut instructional time, but one includes a minimum of 10, uh, but they all include at least a minimum of 10 late starts. And again, I point you to the high school because my son will be a senior. And so yes, some of this is personal to me, but I hope I'm speaking for other people. A cut at the high school of 2.61 days with revised draft one. It's just too much for me, and it's the worst of all the world for the students who ride the bus because they have to go for nine additional late starts at the regular time. Um, so I, I would urge you, I, you know, last week you said you don't know why people vote no on your budgets, and I hope to get to meet with some of you soon because I have some fantastic ideas, and I'm telling you, you're going to love them, and it's going to be great. And you heard a lot of people say, we support the schools. Well, I do. You have my qualified support. But if you have a line item in the budget to fill Wentworth or one of the schools with green balloons every day because you read a study that said green balloons were great for learning and it's a million dollar line item in the budget, I won't be supporting that. There are a lot of things I won't support and I can't support 2.61 cut to my to our high school students. I can't support that. I'm not going to be able to support the budget. And I can tell you, I'm a person who voted no for Wentworth, not because I didn't want a school, but because the right plan never came up. I was hoping to see a bigger school and more school consolidation. Some of you guys may have been here when we were voting for a community center. Well, I thought a community center was a great idea, but I thought it should include a pool. So I voted no, again. So we vote no for a lot of different reasons. And you get my support, but you get my qualified support. Um, and I, I really, I know I'm over my time, so I, I don't want to, you know, take up. You guys are off. You're awfully kind, and you're all kind all week listening and taking all my posts and my emails. Um, but, you know, I, I pointed out a study that talks about, you know, how to change the schedule. Kelly and Jody have both mentioned, you know, yes, we need to jump in. We need to study this a lot harder, look at all of these things. I agree with that. For 2017 and 18, we need to dig in. This year, we need to be conservative. We need to go back to the 2011-2012 calendar. That's going to be approximately 19% increase of professional development for each one of our schools to go back to that calendar. Perhaps you could even add one extra early release days. But I thought the words from this study that was from the National School Board Association are really important. Ownership of a new schedule or strategy occurs when everyone is invited to give input, teachers, administrators, students, and parents. Success with a new schedule depends on the involvement of all participants participants and the transformation and a sense that each constituency has a voice heard. Surveys, interviews, focus groups, and informal discussions are all needed. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else from the public wish to speak? Uh, my name is <coughs> Barney Martin, 17 Foxwell Drive, <coughs> and um, really everyone who's talked up here has already s spoken a lot of what I, I believe. I, I looked at the draft one, and uh, I'm seeing we're going from 10 to 21 uh, early release late start. Uh, I don't understand this level of disruption to the students. Late start was a nightmare for, for our family. 
I, I know, and I've heard from a lot of families, and like what, what has been said is that we're going to try to push more towards the early release, whatever plan that we go with. I'd like to see that happen. I've also talked to some teachers who don't like the late start. They don't feel that they get as much as they get from the early release. There's more time or something more available there for them. So I'd like to see, actually to go back to that first calendar and convert all those to early release would be a good thing. And maybe add one or two, like was said, so we can more go into this, ease into this, than this 21. Um, students going in, uh, high school students going in and just spending time, uh, I, don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand the uh, benefit to the student in there. Um, I looked at the calendar, 41 weeks. I could be off uh, to try to do a count. I only saw nine weeks that were uninterrupted by a holiday, late start, early release, vacations, whatnot. Um, I think we have to get more full days going here. We need students in front of teachers, is my feeling. Um, and, okay, I said that. Uh, one comment I need to make from the, the meeting the other night were comments that you had made, uh, Ms. Lang. I couldn't understand you completely because I was in the back of the room, but if you don't like it here, you can move. You said things like this. I was really disappointed just to hear that statement. I'm not sure what else you surrounded that with because it was hard to understand. Um, that, that's really off topic right now. Off yeah, topic, but it is on topic because of everything going on. Okay, I'm moving on because I want to end on a positive thank here. You. Um, I think combining also the early release days uh, with the high school students in the kindergarten is going to help out parents because high school students can help out in the afternoon for when they come home. Um, and lastly, I'd like to see the February break. Since we're running out of time here during the calendar year, why do we need two vacations? This has been brought up years uh, in the past. Um, I'd like to see taking February break out move the, the spring break up, and we can recover those days for teacher time, what we have. I want to thank you all for the hard work that you do. I'd like to thank a lot of these leaders here from the various schools that I have a great relationship with, and thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you. Hi, my name's Stacy Newman. I live at 17 Windsor Pines Drive. I hope you'll forgive me. I left my notes with my not screaming at all well-behaved children at the house. Um, so, I ha so first I want to say I have three little children. Two are not yet in school. My oldest is just in kindergarten. And I think that's important because my comments are limited in that respect. The change as you've drafted it is a much bigger change for the high school students. And so I, that's my response, I think, therefore, is qualified. Um, I was not at all in favor of the initial proposal. I thought it was just simply too much instructional time uh, lost for the children. Um, again, personally, I loved the idea of being able to take my first grader out every week, and the afternoon was my hope um, for events, but I felt that as a town, um, it was too much instructional time for the children. Uh, this, new, this new proposal, um, although I don't like it, I think is a good compromise. Um, I listened and I've read what uh, the administrators have written about the need for improved teaching um, and the need to get this professional development. And it seems to me that um, you've done your best to create a compromise that doesn't totally scrap the professional development that's needed, but yet limits um, the lack of instructional time. Again, the high school students face the brunt of it, but I do think you're listening to the parents by limiting it to them. Those are the kids, uh, well, in terms of parents having issues with care in the morning and things like that, I think that is limited, uh, a much different issue with the high school students. They can stay by themselves in the morning, plus there'll be transportation for them. Um, so, so that being said, I think it is a good compromise. I, uh, I also... Um, we all talk about self-interest, and it's hard not to. <laughs> um, I moved to this town because it's a good town, and I want my kids to have a good education. My kids. Um, I also know that when I, my kids are out of school, I will continue to vote for the school budget. But that being said, I, I, um, I, think, you, I think that from what I've read from you and from everything, you've got to invest in the teacher's professional development. And I appreciate that people are saying, well, my kids are seniors now, my kids are sophomores now, um, they're never going to get their senior year back. And I get that very much. But 
we've, some year it has to start, and, and we've got to grow that professional development. And so I, I think that a limited, a more limited way to do that is important, and that's going to grow our schools um, that have been decimated by the budget that this town does not support, and I don't understand that at all. You have my support. I'm the person who will vote for all the money you want <laughs> to give all the teacher development you want. That's not realistic. So I think that this is a good compromise. Um, I'll just finish up by asking you, begging you, imploring you um, to, to start fresh with the calendar. I know Jody and Kelly and others have mentioned it. Um, I think of like when I try to organize my horribly unorganized house, you know, and I sort of start, the best I do is, you know, tossing everything on the floor and then starting there. And I think that that's what I really think that we should do. Models like Portland is looking at, and I just, I beg of you to really do that um, and see if we can find something even better in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, I'm Peter Weber, live on Springbrook Lane. Uh, two comments. One is, one thing I didn't hear last week was where does professional development end? What's the end goal? Is there a number in mind that this is just a step to? Um, are we going to be hearing about another increase next year? I didn't hear any of that last week, and I, I guess at some point I'd like to know that. The second thing is, I've heard a lot, as I listened to all the reports, I heard a lot about collaboration and partnership and how important that was with various stakeholders. I don't feel that this was a partnership or collaboration with the parent stakeholders. I feel like I tell my 12-year-old son he's going to help plan a vacation, but he's not really helping plan a vacation. I love my son. I want to hear what he has to say, but I'm not changing the vacation because he says he wants to. That's how I feel in this role. I don't understand the process that you're voting on proposals provided by one of your stakeholders. There's not a proposal that the parents put in front of you. And from what I understand, you're not allowed to vote on anything other than what the administration has given you to vote on. That process to me seems flawed, and I'd like to see that changed. I would like to see your other stakeholders put proposals in front of you the next time we go to one of these meetings. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Anyone else? Michael Hoffheimer, uh, 188 Payne Road. Um, I just uh, real quick want to say um, I really appreciate the work that the uh, schools do in Scarborough. I have two kids in the school system. I've worked in the schools as a substitute teacher, so I've had a privilege to interact in each one of the schools in Scarborough. And I think what Scarborough does with um, what we have is pretty incredible, and I think we should all support the schools. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public wishing to speak on this topic? <laughs> Hi, uh, Dave Dittmer, 11 Woodside Drive. I spoke last week a little bit, and uh, I looked at the, the new calendar. I wasn't crazy about it with the combination of late starts and early releases. Um, the compromise uh, definitely did not make everyone happy or anyone happy, I think. <laughs> but it kind of is acceptable. And a lot of people have said we want to get more engaged in the process, and I know there's going to be the, uh, the collaboration happening in April. And I think that everyone here should be there. And I think everyone should really be thinking bigger than we're thinking now. Because all of the things about late starts and early releases really come down to money. If we had our choice, we would have the teachers have an extra paid day or an extra two paid days or extra three paid days so they can collaborate. But we're not asking for that because we don't think we can get it. And I want us to get it. But in order to get it, the parents are going to have to come out, the teachers are going to have to come out, and everyone's going to have to come out and vote, which we don't do. So I'm calling on them, us, to get involved and get active. The calendar, it's a symptom. The actuality is what we need to work on, and that's the budget and getting more money for the schools. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else? Very good. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing portion of uh, comments on this calendar. So we're looking at one calendar, and that's the calendar that was submitted was for first reading. It was submitted just about a month ago. 
So, and now we have a revision to that calendar number one. So, do I have a motion on the floor here? Move approval for a second reading from the revision. Second. Okay. Discussion. Did she say first reading? Second. 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 First second, second reading, reading of the revision. Of the revision. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so, it's not perfect. We know that. Nobody pretends it is. Nobody pretends it's ideal for anybody. It's better than it was, recognizing that the professional development is necessary and has to happen. So to your question about um, where does it end? So there's a perfect storm of issues right now affecting the high school. The proficiency-based diplomas, which is a law that we are required to prepare for and abide by, which is our current seventh graders, by the time they graduate in 2020, will be graduating with a proficiency-based diploma. It is an unprecedented amount of work required of the entire school system to prepare for that. We can't wait until 2019 and start translating grades to a proficiency dip diploma. That's not the way it works. At each step along the way, the students have to prove that they not only can get a D in a class, but they are proficient in it, means they can, they've learned it, they understand it, they can apply it. The way teachers need to teach that material, the way they need to evaluate their students is incredibly different than 99% of the teachers in any school system in Maine right now learned to teach. It's very different, it really is. If you have younger kids, you might see that some of the classes and some of their grades are different because they're piloting already. We're piloting um, particular classes or phase levels in small increments because Scarborough is doing what we are required to do. So for instance, in the third graders writing assignment, <clears throat> there are perhaps four different goals of that assignment. How well they understand what, they, um, what the assignment is. Did they include particular facts that were required of the assignment? Did they um, have good paragraph structure? Did they have good handwriting and spelling and punctuation and capital letters and all the things that if it was just a B on a paper, okay, good enough. That student has nowhere to go to understand what they could do to get an A or from um, a D to a C. With proficiency-based teaching and learning, the student is not only just given a subjective grade. It's very particular. You understood the assignment, points for that. You um, answered the questions that you needed to in the writing assignment, points for that. Your handwriting was a little sloppy and you didn't put periods after every sentence. That's where you need to work. That's what the difference is. That student now knows specifically in that class what they need to work on. Instead of just saying, I got a B, I got a C, good enough. Now they know they have a goal. It's very clear. It's communicated between the parents, the teacher, the student. The teacher knows exactly where they need to focus their attention for that student. The parents know from getting the rubric back on the assignment. This is what the student needs. This is the part that's missing. This work, this different way of teaching is so different, it's incredibly different than any other time I can think of in educational history. Honestly, it's that different. It's not just, did they get the point of what I was trying to say? Yep, good enough. It's very specific and that's the requirement of a proficiency-based diploma. So we can't start when the kids are juniors and about to be seniors. We need to start when they're freshmen. Were they proficient in Algebra 1? So that class already has to be up and running by the time our current 7th graders are ninth graders. That is not a long time from now. That all, every class they take from the minute they set foot in the high school has to be proficiency based. Every class they're evaluated on. We can't start when it's later and then backtrack. We can't bank on the fact that some people are hoping this will be repealed. There is a bill in our legislature right now that is to repeal it. There's no indication that that is going to pass and that this will be repealed. We are following the law. 
that is a huge amount of work that needs to happen. Whether you agree it needs to happen inside or outside the school day, I would love it outside the school day. I would do anything to make it outside the school day. The reality is we do not have the budgetary support in Scarborough to make that a reality. Perhaps that could be in the budget for next year, but this year we already have an indication that just our status quo budget with less than 1% of our budget going to new improvements or anything that's going to grow our school system, less than 1% of the budget, and already we're being told that's too much. So to include professional development outside the school day, we need to compensate the teachers. Absolutely and obviously. Teachers already work hundreds of hours in a year beyond what's contractually required of them. But to have professional development outside that time and not pay for it is unrealistic. We can't require teachers to attend. So it is a primary goal for me starting in the summer to turn the calendar on its head. And I welcome anyone who would like to join me, parents, teachers, school board members, administrators, whomever, would like to join a little coalition to really turn the calendar on its head. Please join us. That can also, a part of that, as was mentioned, the calendar is a symptom of a much bigger budgetary problem. This year, we have to get the ball rolling with proficiency base incredibly at the high school. They do not have any common meeting time. They can't send all the kids to art. There are not nearly enough allied art teachers. There are not nearly enough study halls in the world. They have to have time all together to collaborate. And it's, it needs to be in small little bits so they can build on it. So people are saying my kids are in high school, they're not getting the benefit of this. I absolutely disagree. Because by starting this year, your kids, whether they're freshmen, sophomores, juniors, or seniors, are going to get the benefit of it. Because the teachers will be able to meet every other week. How is it going? What can we do to improve? What's, where are kids not getting it in your class? What have you tried? What can we do differently? The very next week, they're trying it in the class. The very next day, the very day, they're doing it in their class. They're getting back together the next week. How did it go? Are you seeing improvement? It's very specifically geared to immediate improvement. Your high school students need this. They need this. So for the sake of 2.61 days being missing out of their calendar, it is so necessary and will make such a huge difference in any student in Scarborough's time in our schools. That's our goal. We can't think about just one kid or my own three kids. We have a very busy life. I have a third grader and two seventh graders. It's not convenient to have things come out of the school day or disrupt our schedule. But I need to be thinking for the entire school system and 3,100 kids and the benefit to them to have this professional development time in spite of the lack of instruction time or the less instruction time is absolutely worth it. It's Besides the proficiency-based diploma, the high school also is undergoing an accreditation. That alone takes hundreds of man hours, hundreds of man hours. That has to happen with the teachers. If we don't have the teachers to do it, we will fail accreditation. There's no doubt about it. And then your high school students, and my kids coming up to the high school in a few years, are going to an unaccredited high school. It's a perfect storm of budgetary situation that we, have, we don't have the money for it, the NEASC requirements for the accreditation, and the proficiency-based diploma. Nobody likes it. I promise you, none of us like it. But this is the reality we have right now. We have done the best we can to try to trim it where we can, and the urgency is in the high school, and that's where we find that it will be the least disruptive to family life to focus on the high school this year and start over in, in the summer, in the fall, with a brand new calendar. So that's my 1,000 pieces about it. So Thank you, Ms. <laughs> yeah. Murphy. Does anybody have anything to add to that? <laughs> yes, um, Emma. I, was just, I just have a question about the revision of draft one. Why are we doing the switch between going from one week doing late start to one week doing early release? What is, why is that? It, I think I am probably the best one to answer that. Um, I, I'll, I'll actually go through, and maybe it would be helpful for the board as they're yeah. thinking. I'm, I'm going to go through the changes, OK? okay. Um, the, in K-8, the earlier option had added between 10 and 4, I mean, I'm 10.4 and 28.6 additional teacher learning hours. The additional time was to be gained by the addition 
of between 8 and 22 late starts. And I believe um, one of the uh, uh, citizens uh, spoke to the fact that there were five different iterations. So there's the first one, and now there's this revised one. So I'm going to talk about what that is in that revised one. Revi revised draft one leaves the current schedule of late starts intact. There's 10 of them. I'm talking about K-8 now, Emma. Um, and adds only four additional hours by simply adding two early releases. They're, they uh, they uh, consist of two hours each. One happens in October and one happens in March. So what you're seeing on the calendar is not a flip-flop. It's just basically an insertion. And the only gain K-8 for professional learning time is four hours gained through two early releases. You find them there? Yeah. Okay. Um, 912, um, the options drafted after the first reading of draft one main maintained the much needed additional time to a time strapped school of 28.6 hours. It was 22 additional late start Wednesdays. Okay, that, so it was basically a late start every Wednesday. While certainly not ideal, this revision of draft one would add only 11.7 hours. So they would have the same 10 late starts that the K-8 has and on the same exact schedule. And they would actually have um, an additional nine late starts that happen two weeks before that Wednesday. So it's, there's a pattern. The, the pattern is that the late starts for K-8, the 10 of them, have been placed on the very last Wednesday of every month. The very last Wednesday that Wednesday. we would be that we would be uh, having school. And for, for um, the high school, there would be a, an additional nine late starts um, that would happen two weeks before. So there's, there's a bit of a pattern, and it's spread out. The, the, um, and just, uh, they have some numbers here. So, um, so while this is not ideal, um, it would add 11.7 hours, OK? <laughs> Um, and as well, the four additional uh, hours that they would gain because K-12, those early releases, the one that happens in October, the one that happens in March, would be shared. They would be, so we would do, be doing early release two times a year on the same exact day for everybody. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And, and that may help others uh, who uh, uh, have a different understanding of it. Any other comments? Yes, Mrs. Shea? I just wanted to um, add a few just tidbits. Kelly, I think, said it more eloquently than I ever could. So that was great. Um, a couple things, though. I have slight hesitation <coughs> with the late start Monday, early release Friday idea, just because the, th the things I've heard with regards to attendance on those days, the attendance on a late start Monday would be lower than uh, early release Wednesday or something. People would tend to extend their, their weekends, rightfully so. Um, or if it was an early release Friday, you know, like tomorrow, or tomorrow would be a nice day to have an early release Friday. It's right before the Easter weekend. So people would be extending the weekends and it would just really cut more instruction time out of the classroom. So that was my hesitation with that. Um, and I think it was Betsy who got up and said we were sort of shooting things down last week at the meeting. And we don't mean to be Debbie Downers in those meetings, but it's just that we've sort of already gone through that with this process. And when we first saw the calendar, having discussed it and, and gone back and forth, so it's not that we're shooting down your ideas, it's that we've already sort of explored it slightly and can speak to that. Um, and I, I'm not opposed to the idea, um, when you have your coalition of, of people this summer, um, looking at the vacations, the two vacations, February and April, reducing that to one. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not, you know, I, I think we need to put everything on the table and, and work from there. So just some of my thoughts. Mr. Kelly? Um, well, first with a couple questions. Dr. Russell, can you please explain the reasoning behind the combination late start early release scenario for the K-8? I think um, <clears throat> for, for K-8? 
Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. It's, it's the only way that they would no, no, gain no, an no, additional. The early, the early release only applies to K-8. Is that correct? No. no. K-12. K-12. K-12 also? Yes. Okay. That was not my understanding. Okay. So, sorry. Please. Uh, it's, it was the only way to add some additional uh, time to the K-8 uh, teacher learning time um, without adding additional uh, late starts. Okay. You see what I'm saying? It's, I do. It's, it, I, it's a net gain of four hours. And it's gained by um, every every um, uh, building K twelve because okay. it's it's strategically put in October and strategically put in March. And the reasoning behind that, and not just adding late starts to keep it contiguous through the calendar, was I, I think um, I think we felt that it was important to uh, uh, to if we're going to add uh, um, more time to. Uh, Try the the uh, early releases again. There's been, there were historically there has been significant issues with with um, early release, um, but you know we thought let's let's do that. It doesn't add more late starts. It gives us two chunks of two hours rather than two chunks of smaller than two hours as the late starts do. Um, it was it was an attempt to be a little bit more creative and to give us some data about how that works. Okay. Um, can you also please explain how the bus transportation is going to work for the high school on high school only late start days? High school only late start dates um, would the buses would run their regular schedule. So students who are dependent on bus transportation uh, to the high school w um, would need to take the bus at the regular time and uh, spend their time in the library uh, catching up, doing some project work, whatever it might be. They would. Um, uh, they would uh, have uh, access to a number of areas uh, that they could work in the high school. Do we I have, sorry, go ahead, I also just, um, we took a count of how many high school kids rode the bus, and question. we have 235 students who ride the bus who are high school students. That's okay. it. That was so, going to be my next question, um, yeah, thank you. Sorry, from all four grade levels, there's only 235 high school kids that ride the bus. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to accommodate the 235 students that arrive at the normal time while, I mean, are you, where are those students going to, are they going to be spread out throughout the building? Are they going to be in the cafeteria, the auditorium split? Or are they going to be in designated areas? Or there will be designated work? areas and there will be a protocol that um, Mr. Creech and his staff will put into place. Um, there will be uh, general supervision. Uh, some of the folks that are not typically involved in, um, in the teacher learning time uh, would take on responsibility there. And it's, and so it is, um, yeah. All right, uh, well, I'll, I'll add my comments. Um, I, I mean, the fact that the calendar requires such a lengthy and detailed explanation from the superintendent really does, I think, convey the complexity of this issue, to say the least. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Mr. Dittmer for really recognizing the core issue here, and it is a resource issue. And this is systemic, and uh, as the finance guy, I beat that drum every year, but um, it's unfortunate we're in this situation, and uh, we're, we're trying to strike a balance, I guess, for lack of a better word. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have these issues. In a perfect world, the state would fund all their requirements, our budgets would pass, our kids would be happy, and everybody would just go through life and celebrate the wonderful things that happen in town, but unfortunately, we're not there yet. Um, I do want to acknowledge the efforts put forth by Ms. Shea and Ms. Murphy. Um, it's really a tough, tough position to be in. They're really trying to strike a balance between the various stakeholders in this process. I'm, I have full confidence in their intentions and their, their process moving forward. Um, as we talked about before, by definition, compromise means no one gets everything they want, but everybody gets something that they want. Um, Unfortunately, at this point, I, I really don't feel this proposal goes far enough to address the real and genuine concerns that have been expressed by parents, some board members, and specifically our student representatives that, that spoke about this before and the impact it's going to have on them at the high school level. Um, in terms is how it relates to the lost instructional time or the, you know, the severe impact these changes are going to have on our community as a whole. So uh, for these reasons, I really I, I can't support the calendar as it's proposed now. Um, and uh, I, I'd actually request 
uh, the vote approve the calendar be by roll call in accordance with the uh, board policy BEDF. You, are you done? I am. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, Ms. Perry. Thank you. Uh, I have often said that if our children are happy, <laughs> our parents and our teachers are happy. I have changed my mind on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that we can make all of our parents happy. And since I have not heard from our teachers, I can only move forward, as I have always done, with the student as my priority. We need time for our teachers to have professional training, not because they are deficient in teaching, but because they need to be brought in line with new standards. And our children's education and our very teachers' jobs depend on it. A few, day, few years ago, we added 20 minutes of classroom time by using 20 minutes of teacher time that was not classroom time. In other words, they were required to be in school X number of minutes before students and had to stay X number of minutes after children left. And we took that 20 minutes as more classroom face time. And now we're not going to have that. That bothers me on several levels because we committed ourselves as a board to be better communicators with our parents in our community, and we obviously have blown that one on this issue. We do need that time. But the board and the administration I think, should have talked about this and set priorities before it became a public document. I have every faith that what is best for our children is being brought forward by our, by our superintendent and our administrators. There is no doubt in my mind about that. But I can't support what is before us. I can, I can support what we're trying to do at the high school. Those folks can fend for themselves, if you will, with a bit of supervision. But I'm not going to support late starts for our youngsters. I will support early release. And I think that as we move forward, that we've got to start as a board first to talk about a calendar much sooner in the process. I appreciate all of the input from the administrators, from board members, from the public. I want to ask those of you who have sent nasty emails and highly criticized some of our administrators, just think about the job that they do for your children and your community. They don't deserve that. This is a great administration. This is one of the best boards of education I have ever worked with. They always have the best interest of our children in the forefront. And I hope you continue to do so as well. Thank you. Very good, Mrs. Lang. Um, um, I have to say first, I guess, make it clear, um, I have decided not to support this budget, and hopefully we see something new. The calendar, sorry. Um, you know, I, there are a few of my concerns. I know I have got answers. Um, I also want the parents to know that um, I asked about why we cannot do early, more early starts for the children, younger children. And my, the answer I got is that the community service won't be able to accommodate them because they start, they can have college student or what. So that is a 
difficult I heard. So, but this combination is, uh, it is very confusing and I think um, um, even though I really appreciate the leadership have tried to put this together, um, for the high school, I guess the, you know, I worry about the last time instruction to time. And uh, I know the uh, accreditation ought to do, but I guess I haven't fully understand the process and uh, how much time really is needed to do those things. Um, and, uh, you know, we have several things on the table from, uh, we have been talking about a proficient-based diploma. I know um, there are, it's a law and, you know, law and policy all can be set by people and can be changed. So, um, personally, I know Maine is uh, one of the only states in the nation that I did a sister search. Um, pushing for this uh, proficiency-based diploma, and I think the difficulty facing by a lot of the school districts is uh, giving some feedback to the uh, legislators. So I see there is a chance that not going to happen. Why would we be in the forefront of the whole nation in this matters? So, and the the consequences really, really uncertain and how successful this is going to be. I know what Kelly talked about, the way he's teaching the, you know, it's more, get, the teachers get more feedback. I, um, and I think this, it's a very good idea, um, but when you don't have the broad support system, like the nationwide, you have to implement all these things for yourself. The resource take and the trial and error you have to go through is a lot. So I think that, you know, getting holding it slowly may not be a bad idea. And, uh, and so right now, let's, you know, give the more instructional time for the student. I cannot imagine how much student going to learn without going to classes. So, and um, I know it's a compromise, I mean, I really appreciate it. it's a debate for me too. I mean, internally I've been talking to Katie and, um, and uh, Jody. You know, for the high school, another thing is um, this, the, the middle school, yes, early release, there are issues like, the super, you know, are they gonna make trouble? Where are they going to go? And those things, um, you know, do we cancel every, all the, I mean, a lot of detail really to work out. So we just, you know, I think putting more thought and into this and work might be a good choice. Uh, so, I mean, I ho would like to see something new, but um, I don't know if I, you know, my wish is gonna come true, um, but you know, let's see. <laughs> Did you, did you want to speak? I did. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I have sat here for many a day looking this over and and saying to myself, I just this is not something that I can go forward with, knowing what the public is saying, knowing what I've heard from teachers that I know, um, and just talking to other parents. It's and, and even my own student. I've I've got one that graduated last year. Um, and taking away more time, listening to our high school students saying that they're losing the time. I know it's only a little bit of time, but every little bit of time counts. And I just, right now, with the way it looks with, you know, the high school kids, and I know you say only 235 ride the bus, which shocks me. So I don't know if this was like a week-long check or if this was like a, a month-long check, but I see the kids dump out of the bus, or at least last year, well, out at the high school. Up here too. Middle so, school's in that bus too. Middle right. school. But I mean, when I'm seeing them at the high school get out of the bus, I mean, if you're looking at a bus of 80 some kids, you know, however, 84 kids the bus fits, I can't imagine that there aren't more than 235 kids getting out of the bus. But I don't know that, so um, I'll take your word for, for, your, a, for your estimate on your count there. 
but I just think that it's a lot of, here's the high school, here's the younger kids, here's the, it's just a back and forth. And unfortunately, I know a lot of people who have situations in their family that have younger ones and older ones, so they're kind of now bouncing all around. I don't know, at my house, I didn't really let my daughter come home from school and not be supervised, but that's me. That's not everybody. And I had a high schooler, and I trusted her, and I would, you know, let her be there, but yet not every other Wednesday. So for that reason, I'm not necessarily going to be in favor of this. So. And before I appreciate all the work, by the way. I, I don't want to say that you guys haven't been, and I know that we've all talked, and we've talked back and forth. And just. Before I make any comments, um, our high school students, do either one of you want to say something? Um, I really don't like the revision that's been done on draft one. I understand now that the two early releases were inserted to get more time. Uh, for teachers, but it doesn't seem it doesn't seem beneficial to the students, which is the main concern of the board. And to be um, having to balance for families when um, when your K through eight students are going, or when your high school students are going, it doesn't make sense to me that there would be such a deviation and. I feel like we need to make sure that the students are getting their time with their teachers. So whatever we can do to make sure that we're getting that time with our teachers, that's what I hope that we can accomplish. I think that there's a fine balance between the quality of teaching and the quantity of teaching that needs to go on. And I don't necessarily know for sure if this calendar is it. And what exactly that line is, but I think it's important that yes, we might be missing two point whatever days of school, but hopefully the quality and the amount of teaching that we can get done in the days that we do have would be improved with that, so that's important. And so, although I'm not necessarily a huge fan of this calendar right now, I think it's important to note that although there is some class time being missed, the instruction between those improvements that the teachers are going to be making uh, is going to be better for all of the students. Can I comment and then you can close? Sure. Go okay. Um, you go. Okay. Everyone have their turn because I said a lot of it. Okay. Um, I think uh, I'm speaking to the board um, and I, I would like to um, provide uh, some clarity around some things that I think are just important. Um, when we talk about proficiency-based, um, we are not driven by proficiency-based. We are not driven by the law. Uh, 41 months ago, when I arrived here, we began a journey to uh, create a learning organization here and to create a student-centered organization here. And everything that we have done, starting with the community dialogue, has been based on improvements that would move us to be student-centered. Proficiency-based is really just a, a way of doing a report card differently. Changing the way that we fundamentally teach is all about being student-centered. So we know from research uh, that the most effective practices that teachers need to engage in are col uh, collaborative lesson planning, um, having their learning and their peer-to-peer -peer learning embedded as part of their workday. Summer training, um, the recommendation is that summer training should be an additional three weeks added to the teacher's calendar. Um, at the cost per day here in Scarborough, that would cost us $1,725,000, okay? So, um, they, it's, they also need time to do data analysis because we do testing and we need time to analyze that data and, and correspondingly to adjust our instructional strategies so that we're addressing the deficits that we're seeing that's being identified by the, that data. They need individualized coaching, not because they're not proficient, 
but because they have to learn new skills just like the students do. And also peer observation. Um, that's what research says is required. That's basically the intent of this expanded time. It is not to become proficiency based. It is to become student centered. Um, so this is a budget issue. I arrived here again 41 months ago and both staffing and dedicated paid time had been reduced significantly. And what's required is not just um, to, to do this work that I just talked about. And I, again, I would encourage people to, to read the document because it is, it's this transformation of teaching and learning really says this is not easy or simple stuff. We are not doing simple things. We're doing difficult things. The great news, those difficult things when we do, do them, improve teaching and learning, improve teaching. So the recommendation that comes from this leadership council, including me, is focused on what is in the best interest of students. What else do we have to, what else do we have to base our work on? Seriously. I, we're not gaining anything. There's, there's, no, there's no, you know, uh, party that's going to be thrown for us for the teacher, by the teachers or, or anybody else. It is doing what makes sense given the fact that we don't have the staff to do embedded professional development here. We don't have it. We don't have the time because the time's already been taken away. And yet what we need is even more time because we're trying to do something that's transformational. And it's not transformational for the adults. It's transformational for the students. You know, you look at the numbers, and the numbers tell you everything. The average in York and Cumberland County of teacher development time, teacher learning time, is 59 hours per year. We are at 38.3 hours. That's where we are right now, 38.3. Now, here's something really interesting, because I know a little bit about one of these districts anyway, and you look at districts like Cape Elizabeth, and you look at Falmouth, and you look at Cumberland, and you look at, um, well, maybe not Cumberland. Actually, Cumberland has a, um, has a early release weekly. or weekly, every, every week. Um, but Falmouth and Yarmouth, anyway, you don't see a lot on their calendars. You know why? Because their staffing levels are completely different than Scarborough. So uh, what's the likelihood that we're going to add, for example, the 20 full-time equivalent faculty that should be at our high school right now if we were just average with the top 10 high schools in the state. A cost of over $2 million per year. Ain't going to happen. And so what we're expecting of our teachers and our staff is to continue to do more with less. And I think everybody else agrees with that. Uh, that's what we do. We also function at one of the lowest per pupil costs spent for administration. So the reason why I'm 40 and I look this way <laughs> is because 41 months, 41 months ago I arrived here. And look at David Creech. He's, you never know he's 27. So having Falmouth and Yar Yarmouth and these other places embed it in their schedule actually deflates what the average time really is. It's probably more like 70 hours, and we're sitting with 38.3. The thing I want to clarify, because I think it's thrown around and not clear, is that a schedule refers to the sequence of the day's events, of the classes, of the activities that are happening. The calendar, when we speak about it, refers to the sequence of days that the schools are operating and what's happening. So when we're looking at research, we should be looking at research on school calendars, not school schedules. Um, I guess um, that's all I have to say.
Yes. Do you want to speak no, first? Okay. No, okay. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about early release because I didn't discuss it before because originally, um, I mean, my kids were in school when Scarborough had early release. They were very young. It didn't matter to me. Late start, early release. I could accommodate either one. It didn't matter. And when we had the original calendar proposal and it was all late starts and everyone said, why not early release? We said, great. We'll swap them. They'll all be early release. And I wasn't really thinking it through. What does that mean? What does it mean for a 12-year-old at the middle school whose parents work till 5? And we've heard a lot about they could take all these enrichment classes. They could take an art class. They could go to a museum. They could go to the mall. They can't do any of that without a ride. They can't do any of that if their parents are at work. This only happens if you are lucky enough to be out of work, to be able to drive your kids around or find someone who can do that. The reality is we will have hundreds of children in this town with nowhere to go and nothing to do and parents at work until five or six. They end up at the library. They end up standing on the sidewalk of the middle school, waiting for a ride, not sure if someone's coming. The buses are long gone. Administrators and teachers are trying to do their professional <coughs> development and now they're responsible for dozens of kids that are loitering in the school for lack of anything else to do. That is the honest reality of what happens on an early release in Scarborough. It's the truth. It is better for a lot of people, but for a lot of people it's not. I agree. Any kind of disruption to a day or to a schedule or interruption to a work day for a parent is horrendous. And it's terrible that we have to do it. But early release is not a good option for a lot of people. They may not have been here today. We have heard from some of them. We know they exist because in, when it, it happened before, before in Scarborough, it was not a good situation. There's a high school student who has yearbook meeting at 3 o'clock because the advisor is in professional development. So do they ride the bus home and then try to get a ride back? They don't have a car. They don't have a license. With the um, provisionary licenses that students get now, you can't just go pick up your friends and head back to school for practice because you have to wait at least nine months before you can ride with, drive with anyone besides your immediate family members. That eliminates a whole bunch of carpooling that used to be able to happen. This is a reality. How are these kids getting back to practice? How are they getting extra help in their classes? If they have practices or games all the other days, I'm not trying to put athletics ahead because I never do that, but it's a reality. What if they have chorus? What if they have academic decathlon after school? They need to meet with a teacher. They need to get back to school. When are they doing that? It disrupts the flow of the normal school day with early release. When you come to school late, perhaps younger children have, have a harder time settling down into the routine because they get to play longer in the morning and they're not used to that in their morning. But the reality is, once they get to school, it proceeds as normal. There's no shortening and we're leaving early and you're going to have lunch at 10.30 because we've got to get lunch in before the buses all come and you've got to leave. And the middle school in particular does not have a big enough cafeteria to have several lunches that aren't starting very early. So kids are getting to school and immediately having lunch, essentially, you know, an hour or two later. It's a crazy way to have a school day. The whole day is more disrupted with early release, not to mention what happens after school. Like I said, in my family, particularly, it's fine. Either way, I can make it work. For a lot of families, that's the case. But we need to think about all the students, and many of them don't have a ride to go and do the enrichment activities, or they don't have money to get signed up for an art class. Community services cannot accommodate the extra load of students in the afternoon. They've told us that. They cannot extend aftercare to have an early release package. They can extend that opportunity for late start. Again, not ideal, and I'm sorry there's an additional cost for families. That's the reality we're dealing with. Community services has told us we cannot accommodate those kids. So where are they going? Okay, it's high school students. What about those high school kids we just talked about who have to get back to school for a yearbook meeting or need help in their classes? How are they getting back there when they're home now babysitting for younger siblings? It doesn't work for anybody. It might work for some, but for most it doesn't. And I um, actually respectfully disagree with my colleague, Ms. Perry, who said we blew it with communication. I feel like I've been tap dancing for five weeks, just constantly disseminating information as fast as possible to answer people's questions. I want people to understand the situation we're in. 
And it seems like it's short for some people, but five weeks is a long time for a school board to spend on any particular issue. And it's been five weeks, five full weeks of discussing and debating and trying to figure out alternatives. We've looked into surrounding communities. We've looked into how Scarborough's done it in the past. We've tried, we've tried, we've tried. And I really feel like this is the best we're going to get this year. It's, it's too bad, but I feel like that's where we are and it's the best we're going to get. Ms. Perry? May I debate with her? <laughs> Do you need well, permission? Well, you can make a comment. <laughs> when I said that we didn't communicate this, it, I was referring to the fact that it, it appeared there was no rollout. There was, it went from eight or ten to 32 when you got the paper, in, including us. We had no uh, idea that this was, was coming down the pike. So that's number one. Number two, uh, the reason I am opposed to the late start for the youngsters is that for all the reasons that, that we heard, that the, the buses don't come on time, that uh, it's a serious burden on some families to have to pay extra for child care. If we could provide the child care, I'd vote for it in a minute. And that's the truth. That's funny. But how many, you know, you, you look at the numbers and you look at people, even one child at, at $10 a day, you know, $15. Oh, 15. Sorry, I had heard 10. I had heard that too. But uh, you had heard the same. Was, and I found out that. But if you have multiple children in your family, and I, I just can't support that. I truly, truly can't. Yeah. I, 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 I don't want to say we're getting off topic because it certainly is topic. The proposal that was put at the table is very specific. Um, it doesn't include the early releases, and, and I think that kind of, or two early releases, excuse me, but it doesn't really answer the debate of late start versus early release. Um, I think, to your, to your point, Kelly, uh, uh, yeah, five weeks is a long time for a board to spend on one particular issue. Um, but I do think that to develop a meaningful solution and to do it in a way that involves everybody takes time. We've known about the NEASC. We've known about the requirements coming through. We've been working on professional development for 41 months. Dr. Entwistle is very correct with that. Um, so this wasn't, shouldn't have been a surprise to us, but it was. And I think that my opposition isn't to the need for time. That's very, very, very clear. It's obvious. The administration, the leadership team is very articulate with the need for that. That's not the question. That's, in my mind, that's not the issue. It's the need to do a proper evaluation and a proper process to involve stakeholders. I used the Kennebunk example as a, as a template. I'm sure they didn't sit down from day one and go, that's the way we're going to do things and let's make it work that way. There was a lot of interaction, my understanding. There was a lot of community outreach. There was a lot of dialogue and discussion. And it doesn't mean that one group, uh, you know, gets to control the whole process. The administration has needs. That's very clear. It's very articulated. We're all well aware of those. The, 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 the students have needs. That's, that's why we're here. That's our job. That's what everybody's job is. That's not a question. The parents, the community have a responsibility. That's true too. You know, parents parent, right? I mean, they've got a, they're, they're in charge of their kids. They're put, there's a lot of other pressures on them as well. It doesn't belittle that. It doesn't mean one supersedes the other. It means to have a proper dialogue and have a proper solution and a proper compromise requires time. A time and a process. And I just think that we, 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 we rushed through this, not intentionally. I don't think anybody's trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes or anybody's trying to do anything deceitful. I just think that it's too much too quick. And it's very difficult for anybody, I don't care who you are, to do a radical change like that, whether it's needed or not. The, the, the case has been made in my mind. I agree. I condone it. I get it. We're just not executing it the right way. 
And that's the challenge that we have. Yes, we do have communication problems. If we didn't have communication problems, we'd be passing budgets. We wouldn't be having debates like this. We'd have involvement from the community. We'd have people getting up instead of being outraged and frustrated, they'd be engaging and saying, hey, let's talk about this. I know what your needs are. I understand that. Let's talk about this. Let's create a group. Let's create a forum. Let's work on this. We've been saying that from the very beginning, not just about the calendar. I agree the calendar is a symptom. It really is. <coughs> the issue is our communication and what the community wants and community engagement. We've been pounding the desk since day one of me being on here. Apathy, parent involvement, get out and vote, be involved. We can only do what we can do. We're doing the best that we can. I have no question about that. I think everybody here has the very, very best of intentions. It's not a, an opposition to an idea. It's not. The idea is necessary. It's there. It needs to happen. It's very clear. We've got to execute it better. We really do. And, and I'd, rather, I'd much rather have this debate and have this discussion and have this exchange however heated it may be, because that's the catalyst for getting us all together and working together and improving things. And, and I think we, 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 we do have an obligation to try and strike a compromise at this point that, that you know, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, right? Try and, and, and find a way to balance the needs of the high school are real. We all know that. But, but it's not a surprise. So we've got to give them a little bit of room here now. We've got to come up with a compromise that works. That's a stopgap. It's not going to be everything to everybody. We've got to come up with a way that gives everybody a little bit for right now. It's as little as disruptive as possible right now. And follow through exactly with your idea of developing a community group, developing a, co a coalition, whatever you want to call it, and start doing the real work. Start doing the, the addressing the budget issues and how that impacts us. Everybody, we're very boxed in with what we have to do and how we have to do it. We all know that. We just got to communicate that a little better and we got to get involvement from everybody. So, it, it, this, you know, this is one of the hardest votes I've ever had to take because it touches everybody. And there's a lot of emotion in it. Yep. And, and we, emotion is very easy to get tied up in. Let's look at some facts. Let's look at some figures. Let's take some of Dr. Entwistle's uh, 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 information that is, that is objective. And let's incorporate that and have that discussion. Let's look at the objectives of, of what, what are the other objectives around? How did that work? Let's do that. Let's take the time to do that and not rush into something like this. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And, and, and again, I, I think everybody sitting here, no question in my mind, has got the best of intentions of, of, of our students. That's never, ever been an issue of any topic we've ever discussed here. So I know it's emotional. I know it's tough. I, I can't support it in the form that it's in right now. I really think we need to, to work on moving forward with it. I, and I'd be happy to participate in any way, shape, or form that we can do that with. Because it's that important. It really is. There shouldn't be a, a policy issue or a, or a finance issue. It's our issue. It's a community issue. It's a, it's, it's a group problem. We ought to solve it collectively. That's my soapbox, sorry. Is it my turn yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've said right from the start if there was some way I guess not. that we could uh, <laughs> provide childcare assistance that it would, would ease the strain. <sighs> okay, now? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Thank you. So, well, a lot's been said, so um, I'm, I just want to take just a minute to, to say what, what I've thought about. So um, I think we, we've been going through this for five weeks. We've got to have a calendar pretty soon because we can't wait. The policy said have it by April 1, so <laughs> um, we're going to be late on this. But um, I, I think we've listened to parents. We appreciate them getting involved. Um, I think we've heard from a lot of different opinions on this. I hear a lot of, uh, but you're affecting my life, you know, as much as I hear a concern for, for the students. Um, I think we needed a compromise, and, and some people mentioned that tonight, and I, I think the uh, school department did bring a compromise forward. I, I remember telling you that I attended a, um, 
a workshop over in South Portland about two months ago where three school systems uh, presented, and one of those was Noble. And I recently heard it, so I saw the presentation about the work that they're doing and how they're changing education at, at Noble High School. So I, um, I've also heard from other educator friends who tell me Noble, Noble, Noble's coming forward with some really terrific work. So I decided yesterday to call Noble and talk to them about what's happening and ask them how they managed to get through this issue of having the time for their staff to do the work. And so I, I fortunately had a call back from the assistant superintendent. Uh, Sue Austin is her name. And um, we talked for several minutes about the place we're at here in Scarborough. And it sounded like they were at this exact same place three years ago. And uh, they had, she, I didn't have to tell her what our parents were saying because she told me what her parents had said three years ago and how they had to work through that. And it's basically all the same kinds of comments, the same kinds of concerns. But down there, um, and they're, they're facing the ask as well, so it's all the same kinds of work that's being done. But for the past three years now, and she said, this issue of late starts and early releases is a non-issue. There's no, there's no problem. They have uh, late starts 6 through 12 every week on Thursday mornings. And um, it has meant that they could transform how teaching and learning is happening in their school district. And she said, and I quote, we have made volumes of progress on these topics because our 6 through 12 had those, those, um, that opportunity to spend that concentrated two and a half hours a week on this, this work. I wish that this new proposal had included the 6 to 8, eighth grade, because it's got to start, it's got to start down there as well as the work, work in the high school. You, you know. I, I wish, I hope that we end up getting computers because I think that will help resolve some of the high school issues of late starts because now teachers and kids are connected 24 hours seven. So kids could continue working, but um, it's really, you know, we need to ask our leaders maybe to show us the work gained at the end of the year. If, if we were to be able to, you know, have more time for teachers to do the work. Um, this isn't about parents. It isn't about teachers. This is about kids. Any parent in this or any other school system in Maine that has a seventh grader or younger has a huge investment in this piece of work that's about to be done because it's got to be done and it will be done. The question is, how do we make sure that it's done during some quality time in which people, professionals, can put their heads together and get this all figured out? They're doing it in other places. I know we can do it, too. Um, it, it's about figuring out how and why would people not be in favor of the best thing for their kids to be able to demonstrate their learning and apply their knowledge. This is, uh, it's, a, it's a new tact in the way teaching and learning will happen. So um, I, I think it's a compromise. I'm satisfied with it. I would approve it. I would say we're holding on the same plan, K, in, in this case we change it to K-8, but. I would have liked to have seen it just K-5, but it's K-8, holding on what we did this year, and then just adding one more <coughs> additional monthly time for, for, the, for the high school. So I do support it. Any other comments? Has there been any discussion about 
covering uh, children at, at the K-8 level? I think the discussion has been with community services because that's the only resource that we have. There's, it, we, we don't have the capacity to be able to cover um, students when we're trying to do professional development. We have no, there's nobody to do that. Anyone else? I, I guess I just want to add one more um, point, you know, uh, thoughts of mine. Um, I know Dr. Intreso has been talking about, you know, the profession-based um, learning, you know, it's not about the diploma. Um, I guess my whole feeling, you know, I know you, you've been working on this for, you know, ever since he started. I guess what really bothers me is, yes, we don't have the money. It's too expensive for us. And change is hard. You know, you have to ask the teacher to change the way you teach. And I can imagine lots of teachers resent that. You know, I imagine especially in all the higher grades, <coughs> teachers are harder to adapt new ways to do it. And. Uh, just thinking about how hard our budget season has been and how you know how tight our budget is, I just sometimes I just want to say you know what let the teachers teach, let students get through their textbooks, learning materials, and uh, yeah maybe it's uh, it's you know not an innovative approach, um, not really most you know, advanced way of moving forward. But that's what Scarborough can afford at this moment. Um, so I just wanted, you know, that's how I feel. Um, we just cannot afford it. So I hate to see the student time get taken away because we are, you know, doing all this. Yes, the intention is wonderful. It's, but the, you know, it's not something. But this is not something that without risk. We are basically taking away the time from the kids to say, you know, maybe this is going to turn out great. Go ahead. Yes. I would respectfully disagree. I think we absolutely can afford it and need to do it. If we're talking about the it being time, I absolutely think we have to do it. My kids, our kids, need our teachers to have that development. And frankly, I will support this, this compromised calendar. I have been very clear about that. But I think by saying we can't afford this time is very short-sighted. And it's very short-sighted for me, if we're all talking personally, with a first grader. I need his teachers to be prepared to teach him all the way through, because it's going to be very different than it is right now. I agree. I mean, I understand that. It's just how, I, you know, when you don't have the resource to do it, it's you know, you do have to prioritize and, uh, you know. So, I mean, just like say we want, I mean, we wish we can get, I really would love to support every single budget just as the way George proposes. I would love to support that. Then we will have wonderful things happening. But we don't, you know. It just, I really, really like, uh, I think, Chris has been talking about, and uh, Dave has been talking about, engage the public. And Nick, think about today, we only have like five parents here, or five, six, or so a few of them. We don't have that engagement enough to push through anything that's going to be, bring us the resources we need. And it's a lot of work, yeah. But right now, you know, it's very dismal to me what reality looks like. So that's why I say it's not I don't like new, new ideas and doing things better. 
I agree with you. It is maybe you know innovation is always good. We change things, and things goes better. But do we have the resources to do it right now? I, I personally just don't think we don't think so. Anything? I, I, I uh, had my say. Okay, and we'll have a roll call vote here. So, and I believe I'm the one that does that, right? Mr. Chiazzo? No. We can't what? take new business. We already no, no, have a No, 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 we've already opened this up for business. We, we can't do new business after 9.30. <laughs> oh, nice try. <laughs> It was good. No, that was good. That was good. I would have done the same. Mm. Mrs. Shea? Yes. Mrs. Murphy? Yes. Ms. Perry? No. Ms. Lang? No. Ms. Maslingill? No. And myself? Yes. Girls? Um, you can. It doesn't end up actually counting in it, but you can give the right to say. <laughs> I'll vote no. I vote no. All right. So we have four no's and three yeses. All right. So, so no Back school the, next year. Back to the drawing <laughs> board. That's school. what that means, right? School's Back canceled to the next board. year. <laughs> so I'm going to call for a five minute uh, recess. We have to. Um, we, we've got no to new stop. business after 9.30. Yeah. So. Oh, I thought it was 10. Nope. No, no it's nope. 9.30. 10 for the council, 9.30 for us. We need to go to Okay. Bed. So I guess that brings us right down through to, uh, I'm assuming no one has any Maybe. further comments Maybe. before the end of the meeting. I, Do I have a motion? I make a motion to adjourn um, according to policy BE, no new business after 9.30. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor. Not available. Seven plus two. We're adjourned.